you. Um, I did have Madam Reporter take her steno machine and make uh, <clears throat> or take a contemporaneous record of the little bit that was said while we were there. Um, I can state for the record, and I also had Madam Clerk uh, take some minutes. Um, the court arrived at 1144. Um, the state arrived. The defendant arrived shortly thereafter. The parties were each given an opportunity to do a walk around before the ju jury came in. Uh, the defendant did that. And then I walked around as well with uh, my clerk. And then uh, we all were uh, positioned in various locations within the garage. The belly chains and handcuffs were removed from Mr. Brooks. He did not have leg restraints on that I could see. And uh, so when the jury was brought in, uh, he was not in any of that. And then I instructed the jurors at that point, uh, our civilian bailiff, Michael, was in the lead. I said, please come in, uh, walk around the vehicle one time slowly with the jurors, and then exit. That is what they did. Um, two videos were made. One was prior to anyone being in there. Uh, it was just the sheriff's department personnel. I should say prior to the parties being in there. Um, and they took a video of the garage and then a walk around the vehicle that was provided uh, to me at the conclusion. Uh, it was on a large type drive. And then I provided that to Mike Nyman and Zach Tremaine, who then provided that to the media. And then, and then the second part where we all were in there and the jury came through, that was also captured on video. All of that was put on a flash drive and will be marked as Courts Exhibit 1. Along with uh, the docket entries Madam Clerk will make. And then, of course, um, if need be, if a transcript is ever needed, there. Uh, I did document a few things as uh, we went through that process uh, so that there was, there's that contemporaneous record as well. Any party feel the need to add to the record I've just made from the state? No, Your Honor, thank you. Uh, from you, sir? Uh, not to that, no. Okay, thank you then. All right, then I know the jury is ready uh, to be brought back out. I believe the state has additional witnesses. We do, Your Honor, and uh, I have uh, another large uh, poster board that I'd like to show with the next witness. Um, so I don't know if you'd like us to put it up on the witness stand now before he, before they come out, or do we need the easel for, for that? Yeah, we'll need the easel too. All right, I'll have. I'm since there's no jury out, you can put that on the witness stand now. Thank you. Maybe put it uh, facing, facing backwards. And then that will be there for the next witness. Sure, thank you. All right, and then anything from you, sir? In regards to this? Um, any other preliminary matters that you are asking the court to address? Uh, were my filings actually filed? You're talking about from this morning? Yes. Have they been scanned in so that you can get the originals back? Is that what you're asking? Yes. Um, I will ask Madam Clerk if that has happened. They have. All right, it has. Let me see. I think she, uh, in our papers that we have been keeping, there might have been another filing uh, from you. So whatever we have, they've all been entered into the record, and you're getting back as a courtesy um, those filings. That was the one this morning, and then these are the two originals that I have not given back yet. There were two that I gave him immediately, like I scanned them in right away and then gave okay. them back. These are the two I was still holding. There's two other ones, so I have uh, one from October 5, one from October 13, and then one from October 19. These, just so we're clear, sir, I'm providing these as a courtesy back to you uh, because the clerk's office policy is once they're scanned in, uh, they are destroyed because then what's in the electronic file is what's kept. Um, they do not have the docket entries, though, because you requested the originals back. So I'll provide those to you. Okay. 
then with that, we'll have the jurors brought out. Subject matter jurisdiction, Your Honor. The court's declining to address that further. I stand by my written decision that was entered last week. So we won't be proving it for the record? I stand by my written decision that was entered last week, sir. Judicial determination? It, it is a judicial determination. Thank you, everyone. Please be seated. The state may call its next witness. Thank you. The state will call Detective Justin Rowe. Good afternoon, sir. If you would please make your way to the witness stand, which is to my right. When you get there, please remain standing. Raise your right hand. My clerk, Teresa, is on my left. We'll swear you in. Do you solemnly swear that the testimony you're about to give shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? Yes. Thank you, sir. Please have a seat. First thing I will ask you to do is to state your first and last names for the record and then spell each. Uh, Justin, J-U-S-T-I-N, Rowe, R-O-W-E. Go ahead, your witness. Thank you. Uh, Detective, how are you currently employed? City of Waukesha Police Department. Can you uh, briefly describe for the jury your experience in law enforcement? Um, from 2003 to 2009, I was a uh, security police officer with the United States Air Force. And then from 2009 to present, I've been a member of the Waukesha Police Department. And your current rank is that of detective? That's correct. I'd like to direct your attention to uh, the date of November 23, 2021. Were you on duty that day, sir? Yes, I was. Do you recall what your assignment was that day? I was tasked with going to the Maple Avenue and Northwest Avenue area um, neighborhoods to search for items that may have been discarded by Daryl Brooks. And were you alone in that task? No, I was accompanied by an, a whole team of other detectives and investigators. Uh, before you traveled to the neighborhood, did you have a plan of action? We did. We uh, planned to begin at uh, 338 Maple Avenue, which is where the vehicle was um, left prior to Daryl Brooks fleeing the scene south. So we had begun at that location and began to canvas our, our way south and west. Were you present when any items were discovered that were uh, relevant? Yes, I was. And just very briefly describe what those items were, sir. Objection meeting. <laughs> Specialist Spackowitz and I um, we're walking in the parking lot of 322 Maple Avenue, which is a large apartment complex, and we came across a right-footed sandal, a blue sandal, um, up against a fence area that separates the Dunbar neighborhood or street uh, homes from the Maple Avenue apartment complex. Are you aware of any other items that were recovered during this effort on that same day of November 23, 2021. Yes, uh, a short distance from that sandal, um, some other investigators did locate a sweatshirt and a left-footed blue sandal. Now, in addition to looking for items, uh, did you and other detectives attempt, attempt to obtain video from homeowners and businesses in the area? Objection leading. Um, overall, this foundational, the witness may answer. 
Yes, we did. And do you recall obtaining a video from the school district? Yes, we did. And do you recall what building or buildings uh, from the school district uh, video was recovered from? Overruled the witness may answer. It's a uh, building that's right on Maple Avenue. It's uh, we refer to it as the School District of Waukesha. It's their administrative building, also known as the Lindholm Building. And you obtained uh, video from that location. Yes, we did. Did you also obtain video from uh, homeowners on Dunbar? Objection. Overruled. The witness may answer. Yes, we did. Uh, specifically, 435 Dunbar. Correct. Overruled its foundational, sir. Please wait until I rule on the objection. Thank you. And how about uh, Central Street or Road? Yes, we did. Did you have an opportunity to review those videos that were collected? I did. And would you, did you uh, see anything of significance to this investigation in any of those videos? Um, overruled, the witness may answer. Yes. I'm going to show you an item that's been marked as exhibit number 131. And we're going to show it on your monitor first, okay? So let me know when it's up. It's up. All right. And uh, we're going to just uh, take it out of presentation. There we go. Okay. Um, what is it? This is 131, Mr. Brooks. What do you know Exhibit 131 to contain, Detective Rowe? This is a video um, that is taken from uh, 425 Dunbar Avenue, which is the south side of Dunbar Avenue. And if you see on the upper, near the upper left-hand corner, the northern intersection area, there is a red sort of blur near <coughs> the bottom of a driveway right before the intersection. And that is going to be Daryl Brooks on that uh, sidewalk and he's going to cross the street. And okay, uh, hold on one minute. I'm just going to remind the jury. It's up for the jury to determine what the facts are, not what any witness's opinion may be. You will ultimately need to decide uh, who is in that video. Go ahead. And I, I should ask a broader question. The exhibit itself, the whole exhibit, does it contain, do you know what's in Exhibit 131? Yes, I do. Does it contain more than one video, sir? Objection, Lee. Um, overruled, uh, I'll allow it. The witness may answer. Um, I believe this is one video of it itself. Sure, but the exhibit contains multiple videos and Correct. Objection, still Lee. shots? Yes. Okay. Objection noted. I'll overrule it. It's foundational. Go ahead. What are you looking at right now, sir? I'm looking at the beginning of the video of uh, Dunbar Avenue. Okay. Do you believe, um, well, strike that. Um, I'm going to ask the uh, assistant to play this video for you um, at your monitor, and then I'll ask you a question, okay? Okay. Before you do that for the record, how long of a clip is it? I was just looking for that because we're now in a PowerPoint, Your Honor. I don't know that I can tell you exactly until we get to the end. Looks like nine minutes or something. Nine, nine seconds and oh. 9.56 seconds, Your Honor. All right, thank you. Go ahead. All right, so we're playing this for you, Detective Rowe. All right, were you able to observe the video? Yes. And were you able to observe anything of significance to this investigation in the video? Objection, spent with you at that point. Um, overruled, the witness may answer. Yes, it appears the defendant is crossing the street. This exhibit, I'm sorry. Um, are you aware of the other videos and pictures contained in exhibit 131? Yes. Objection, leading. Overruled, the witness may answer. Once again, please wait till I rule on the objections. Do you believe all of the videos and pictures in Exhibit 131 are true and accurate uh, 
based off of the videos that were obtained from the homeowners and businesses that you testified to previously? Yes. I'll move to uh, admit 131 and permission to publish, Your Honor. Objection. Back to the video. Your objection is noted. It is overruled. Exhibit 131 in, in its entirety is received. And did you ask for permission to publish? I did. Go ahead. For the record, Your Honor, this is a PowerPoint. What's being displayed at the moment is slide number one. Thank you. Go ahead. Is it on the jury box? Okay. All right. Uh, please play the video in slide one. Right, the video has played completely, Your Honor. I'm going to ask to move to slide number two. Go ahead. Do you see what's shown on slide number two, Detective Rowe? Yes. Uh, describe what we're seeing in slide two. Upper left-hand corner, you're going to see another still image of the original video. And then below that, you're going to see a zoomed-in, cropped image of the figure that uh, would be crossing the street. Okay. Have you seen this video uh, on other occasions, sir? Yes. And obviously the zoomed in uh, image is quite blurry. Absolutely. Okay. Um, when we played slide one, were you able to make out any details about the person in slide one that was crossing the street? Yes, it appeared the person had a red shirt. Okay. All right, we're gonna go to slide number three, please. And you testified about receiving video from the school building at 222 Maple Avenue, is that right? Objection leading. Um, sustained as to the form of the question. Please rephrase. What is shown on slide three? Slide three is a view towards the rear parking lot of the Lindholm building, or also known as the School District of Waukesha Administration building. And a minute. Request that we play the video in slide number three, Your Honor, in its entirety. Do you happen to know how many seconds? 5.97. Thank you. Go ahead. Objection, irrelevancy. Overruled. You may play. <clears throat> Did it play? Yep. I'm sorry, I missed it. <laughs> Okay, we'll go to slide, uh, next slide. Lost track, we're on four or five. Slide number four. Going to slide number four. All right, so again, uh, the camera, uh, or strike that. What are we seeing on slide four? So again, we're seeing a still shot of the previous video we just viewed. And then there's a zoom in fun function below that where it shows a cropped out photograph of a figure. Okay. And you've seen this video yourself in person, sir? Yes. What do you recall about what you were able to observe about the figure or subject uh, walking there behind the school? Objection, Lee. Overruled, the witness may answer. The figure moves from right to left through the parking lot or north to south up until a fence, in, until it gets, reaches the fence on the left side of the picture. All right, next slide, please. Do you recognize the image in slide number five? Yes. Or is it six? Five, okay. Um, please tell us what you recognize this area to be. This is also the Lindholm building. This is a camera that is deeper into the parking lot, uh, which means that it will be a closer view of the previous um, video. Okay. Uh, I'm going to ask that we play this clip, Your Honor, and for the record, it's a total of 20.81 seconds. Go ahead. Objection. Your objection's noted. Go ahead and play.
Thank you. Please turn to the next slide. What do we see in slide number six? Upper left hand corner is a still shot of the video and below that is a screen capture of a figure in that photo. Okay. Next slide, slide seven. So currently we're looking at a black screen, correct? Yes. Do you know what this video is uh, going to show, sir? Objection speculative. He's black. <laughs> um, overall, the witness may answer if he's able. Yes, it's another uh, home security camera at uh, 126 Central Avenue. All right. It's a total of 20 seconds. Two zero point zero three. I'm sorry. Two zero point zero nine seconds, and we will play in its entirety, Your Honor. And with sound on this one, yes. Thank you. Excuse me. What do we see on this final slide, sir? Upper left hand corner is a still shot from the video and the screen that's been cropped at the bottom is a image of the defendant. All right. That completes exhibit uh, 131. Detective Bro, um, based on these video clips that you obtained and the canvas, uh, that you and your team did in the neighborhood. Were you able to put together a map basically tracking um, the travels of Daryl Brooks through the neighborhood that afternoon? Objection. I don't consider to be in court that day in this meeting. The objections are noted, overruled. The witness may answer. Yes. And I should include. Um, do you know if, uh, do you know the location where Daryl Brooks was arrested? Yeah. Um, overruled, the witness may answer. Yes, I'm aware he was arrested on Elizabeth Street. Okay. And are you aware of uh, reports to other officers as far as citizens that had contact with Mr. Brooks <coughs> in the area of Elizabeth Street? Objection, I don't consider to be called that. Noted, the witness may answer. Yes, I'm aware. All right. Uh, behind you, sir, is a large poster board that's facing backwards. I'm going to ask you to please assist me by putting that face forward on the easel behind you. Can you please tilt that so that the court and Mr. Brooks can see as well. Yes, and we're also going to put up the digital copy, Your Honor. I just wanted to. Oh, okay. Uh, then that's fine then. Okay. Thank you. I'll have him work off the digital copy. But before you sit down, Detective Rowe, sure. in the bottom right hand corner of that poster board, there is a sticker. Do you see that? Yes, an objection meeting. Could you help us by telling us the exhibit number? I'm sorry. That's okay. Um, it's foundational. I'll allow the question to be asked. Go ahead and uh, finish your question and answer. What's the exhibit number, Detective Rowe? 130. Okay. Thank you. Detective Rowe, do you believe that exhibit 130 is an accurate summary of uh, the, the travels and the contacts uh, by Mr. Brooks on the evening of November 21, 2021? Objection. I don't consider Overruled. The witness may answer. Yes. Uh, Move to admit 130 and permission to publish, Your Honor. Objection. Um, I'm sorry. I cut you off. What's the basis, if you have? All right. Uh, your objection is noted. It is overruled. Exhibit 130 is received. Permission to publish. <coughs> An electronic copy is granted. Thank you.
All right. Uh, Detective Rowe, I know we're, we're back out so we can see the whole map at this point. We will zoom in in a moment, but the northernmost uh, event that's reflected on the map reads what? Officer Skelton shoots at SUV at 4.39 p.m. Okay. Do you know that to be accurate based on your knowledge of this investigation? Objection leading. Overruled the witness may answer. Yes. And then there appears to be a red line from that point going south down the middle or uh, right side of the map. Do you see where I'm referring to, sir? Objection yes, leading. Um, overruled. It's foundational. The witness may answer. Yes, I do. What does that red line um, from the star where... We noted Officer Skolton fired the red line going south. What does that represent, sir? The solid red line is the route taken by vehicle. Okay. And where did it go? What roads? Objection. Leading. Overruled. Go ahead and answer. Vehicle traveled south on Northwest Avenue, made a left-hand turn to go east onto Prospect Court, Vehicle then drove behind some residences on Maple Avenue before coming to a rest in the driveway of 320, 338 Maple. Okay, I'm gonna ask Ms. Gussie to please um, zoom in on that upper right-hand quadrant of the exhibit, please. And specifically um, the area of 338 Maple, please. Okay. So um, you said the vehicle traveled through the backyards uh, off of Prospect Court, is that right? That's correct. Um, <clears throat> sir, please wait until I rule on the objection. Um, the objection is noted. Um, it's overruled. Now you may answer. Okay. Can you just, there's, that's a touch screen in front of you, so just kind of point out the area that you're speaking of right now. I'm sorry, could you repeat the question? Yes. Using the touch screen, can you point out the path of the vehicle that you just were describing for us? Objection leading. Overruled. Go ahead. And when it came down West Avenue, right? Yes. And what road did it turn onto? It turned east onto Prospect Court. And then when it turns off of Prospect Court, is that a road? Yes. Leading. Oh. I'm sorry. When it left Prospect, oh. I'm sorry. Sir, which question? Sorry. Which question were you objecting to? The last one. About which way it turned, or turning onto the, Prospect? The, the way it was actually. It um, you know what? I don't even remember what it was, so I'll sustain it and ask the state to re-ask. Okay, sure. At some point, did the vehicle leave Prospect Court? Yes, it did. When it did that, was it on a roadway? No. So the line you drew from south from Prospect Court represents what, sir? Objection leading. Overruled the witness may answer. Backyards. On the far right corner of the map, do you see a blue dot in the same area we're talking about here? Objection leading. Overruled the witness may answer. Yes. And what does that represent, please? the uh, camera at Les Paul School. And where's what's uh, the address of Les Paul School? Objection. If you know, or the street. Overruled, the witness may answer. I don't know the address, but it is right off Maple. Okay. And you see just below that, there's a yellow dot with the name Wauwatosa Officer Sailors. You see that? I do. Okay. Now, You've uh, stopped drawing your line there, your yellow line over the red line. You see what I'm referring to? Yes. And in that area, I notice the line becomes dashed. Do you see that? Yes. Objection leading. Overruled, the witness may answer. Again, please wait until I rule on the objection. Yes. Thank you. What's the difference between the red solid line and the dashed line, sir? The dashed line is the path that the defendant took on foot. Okay. And do you see then, moving back to the uh, left on the map, the two boxes in white uh, 
depicting where the sandals were recovered? Objection, lady. Overruled, the witness may answer. Yes. Is that consistent with your recollection, sir? Yes. The uh, dash line then moves, uh, so there's there's two green X's, correct? You see where I'm referring to, sir? Objection, lady. Overruled, the witness may answer. Yes. And then the red dash line moves to the left or west from the, la the second green X, correct? Yes. Okay. What's going on at this point, sir? This is a point where the defendant is traversing through yards towards the west. Okay. And did we just see the video of him crossing the street there on Dunbar? <coughs> Objection leading. Overruled. Yes. Uh, move up a little, please, or more to the back. Yeah, there we go. Okay. Clear the line, please, Madam Clerk. <coughs> Thank you. <clears throat> Is the Lindum building on this map, sir? Yes. Could you point it out? Did we just see the two videos from those two cameras at the Lindum building in the last exhibit, 131? Objection, leading. Overruled, the witness may answer. Yes. Okay. Keep going south on the map. What's the next event that's noted, sir? Do you want, can we clear? Yeah, yes, clear, I'm sorry. Thank and you. maybe we can uh, move further south on the map. Thank you. So the first uh, thing that I see is makes phone call at 4.47 p.m. Dominic Capron at 4.17 Central Avenue. Okay, is that the location of Central Avenue, sir? Yes. I'm sorry, 4.17 Central Avenue? Objection leading. Overruled, the witness may answer. Yes, it is. Okay, and are you aware of uh, Conversation also uh, reported by Sean Backler at his residence on Central Avenue? Yes. Is his residence shown on the map, sir? Yes. Can you please circle these uh, two conversations that you just identified for us? Objection, lady. Overall, you may indicate on the map. Okay. Now I see the dash line uh, moving to the west again. Do you see that, sir? Yes. What's happening in this area, please? Objection, Spakely, to it. Overruled, the witness may answer. This is the camera at 126 Central Avenue. Um, Mr. Brooks is seen on camera moving to the west at 4.48 p.m. Was that in Exhibit 131 that we just showed the jury? Objection, leading. Overruled, you may answer. Yes. Which video was that one, do you remember? Objection, leading. Overruled, you may answer. It was the, uh, I believe it was the last video that we had watched prior to showing the, uh, the map. Okay. Now at this point, the dash line ends. Is that right? That's correct. Why is that? Objection, speculative. to you. I'll allow the witness to give his opinion. Because we don't have any indication as to where um, or when Mr. Brooks crossed uh, West Avenue to get to Elizabeth Street. Are you aware that uh, there was a report of contact between Mr. Brooks and a witness identified as Ellen Cordes? I'm sorry, Aaron Cordes? Objection, leading. Um, overall, the witness may answer. <coughs> yes, I'm aware. And is that area where that meeting occurred depicted on this map? Yes, it is. Where did that meeting occur? It happened uh, just west of Northwest Avenue on Elizabeth Street. And is Aries Industries shown on this map, sir? <clears throat> yes, it is. Could you identify Aries Industries? Are you aware of uh, video from that location uh, showing person appearing to be Mr. Brooks approaching the front <coughs> door lobby? of the business. Objection, I don't consent to be called that man again. Noted, the witness may answer. <coughs> Overruled, the witness may answer. Yes. Okay. And then finally, uh, the last uh, 
red X on the bottom left corner there, what does that depict, sir? Uh, that depicts 553 Elizabeth Street, the location of arrest, which was at 514 p.m. And that is the residence of Daniel Ryder. And Mr. Brooks makes and receives a phone call at 503 to 505 p.m. Do you believe uh, this map is an accurate documentation of the investigation, again, as to the uh, travel of Daryl Brooks this evening, on the evening of November 21, 21? Objection speculative, and I don't consent to be caught that day. Your objections are noted, overruled, but it's the answer. I'm sorry, can you repeat the question? Sure. Do you believe uh, this map is an a accurate summary of the travel and whereabouts of Daryl Brooks at various points on the evening of November 21, 21? Objection speculative, and I don't consent to be caught that day. Your objections are noted. They are overruled, the witness may answer. Yes. All right, thank you, Detective. I don't have any other questions. Any cross-exam for this witness, sir? Yep. All right, thank you. Begin when you're ready. <coughs> so, Officer Rowe, uh, uh, you repeatedly referred to the alleged defendant's name. How did you come into that uh, information? Based on the entirety of the investigation. And when did you come into the knowledge of the alleged defendant's name? I don't remember. Uh, when did your part of the investigation start? Um, after he drove the SUV through the parade, I was called at home to come in and uh, help the departments with the investigation. And just so we clear for the record, is the jury asking you questions or me? I'm sorry, I did not hear the question. Repeat your question, please. Well, I was referring to when I asked a question, he turns towards the jury as if they're the ones asking the question. That's not a question, Your Honor. It, it is a question. We did ask a question about that. Yes. I think you're asking why does he do that to that extent the witness may answer. I'm here to present the case to the jury. So I follow that fundamentally. But for the sake of making sure you hear the questions right, wouldn't it be fair to say that you should pay attention to the questions being answered and being asked, rather? Assumes fact, not in evidence. Sustained as to the form of the question. Please rephrase. Wouldn't it make sense to focus on the questions so you can hear them clearly? Objection argumentative. Still assumes the fact, not in evidence. Sustained. You made reference to you being here to present the case to the jury. So is that the reason why you decided to testify? Objection to the relevance? Grounds. Overruled, the witness may answer. I don't understand your question. Uh, were you able to hear my question clearly? I don't understand your question. Were you able to hear my question clearly? Objection, argumentative, Your Honor. Sustained. Next question, please. Or rephrase the previous question to the one that was asked just now. What, what, was, what was not understood about the question that you were asked? Objection, argumentative. Grounds. Um, sustained. As to the form of the question, please rephrase. What wasn't clear about what I was asking? Same objection, Your Honor. Grounds. It's, the objection is sustained. Let's go back and ask the question that he says he didn't understand and, and rephrase it, please, or move on. Your choice. Was your sole reason for testifying 
here today. Objection relevance. Let's let Mr. Brooks get the question out. Go ahead. I apologize, I thought that was it. Are you testifying today strictly to prove your case to the jury? Objection, misstatement of his testimony. Grounds that that's what he said. Sustained as to the form of the question, misstates the prior testimony. That's what he said. So why did you, why did you decide to testify here today? Objection, that's a legally inaccurate question, Your Honor. Please rephrase the question. I'm sustaining the question asked as to the form of the question. I don't know how I'm supposed to rephrase that. Without having the same form of the question, that helps. I'll rule if there's an objection, but ask a question, please. <laughs> Did you seek to testify here today in this matter? No. So how did you ultimately come to that decision? Objection, that's a misstatement, Your Honor. It was not his decision. Sustained as to the form of the question assumes a fact, not an evidence. Were you subpoenaed? Yes. Do you recall by whom you were subpoenaed to testify? Uh, District Attorney Sue Opper from the Washington County District Attorney's Office. And at that time you were subpoenaed, you decided to testify? I don't believe it's my decision. Well, it would be fair to say that you didn't have to show up, right? Would that be fair to say? No, I had to show up. But would it be fair to say that you could have chosen not to? No, it would not be fair to say that. Exhibit 131 that was shown to you. Um, have you seen that video footage before today? Yes, I have. Do you recall who showed it to you before today? I don't recall who showed it to me. Would it be fair to say you've seen it multiple times before today? Yes, I've seen it a number of times. And do you recall when you were first shown that video? Not off the top of my head. Was it the same day of the incident, the days following, sometime after? I don't recall when I saw the video the first time. And what about uh, Exhibit 130? Had you seen that video footage before today? Objection, Your Honor, 130 is a map. Well, the map. Had you seen the map before today? I'm, I don't really think it. Just for the record, I'll um, sustain the objection just because it referenced the wrong number, but I believe you rephrased. So go ahead, the witness may answer. Can I ask the question again, please? Had you seen the map of Exhibit 130 before today? Yes, I have. Multiple times as well? Yes, numerous times. Any idea why you viewed it so many times, multiple times? Unsure.
were you able to obtain any more information upon seeing the map numerous times that you didn't obtain when first seeing the map? No. So it would be fair to say you pretty much knew what the map was detailing each and every time you saw it? Yes. And on that map, Exhibit 130, you made reference to at some point the, the dotted line and it, it stops at some point. Would that be fair to say? Could you be more specific? The, the dotted line that was, that was referred to on the map. Do you want the map brought up? Would that be helpful to you? Uh, maybe it be, might be helpful to him. He's got the large map, but if you want to... So, if you can see the dotted line on the, on the map behind you... Yes. Is it fair to say that the dotted line stops at some point? Around Central Avenue, maybe? Yes, there's a couple lines that seem to come to Central Avenue or egress out of Central Avenue that do stop. And you stated that, well, what was the reason that you stated that that line stops, the dotted line? I stated that uh, it's because we don't know the exact location where you crossed the street to get over to Elizabeth Street. And why, what, were there no cameras present at that point? Or how, how did, how did you lose the path to travel at that point. We didn't find any cameras or any eyewitnesses in that area. So it would be fair to say at that point you weren't you weren't sure what happened. I know I know that you crossed the street at some point. We just don't know where. How do you know that? Because you were arrested on Elizabeth Street. Did you see any crossing of I think you said that was West, would that be West Avenue that you were referring to that you don't see any crossing of? What's your question? Is that West Avenue that you stated that you don't see, that you didn't see any crossing of? That is Northwest Avenue. Or Northwest Avenue, I'm sorry, I, didn't, I don't know the streets. Northwest Avenue. And you don't have any visual visual footage or any eyewitnesses, as you said, to say for sure if Northwest Avenue was crossed. We didn't obtain any witness statements or any eyewitness or any uh, video of the suspect crossing the street. And what day, what day were, what day were you doing your part of the investigation? Was that the same evening or the next few days after the, the incident or? Uh, can you clarify which investigation you're talking about? <coughs> the one that you took part in, your part of the, the investigation. Are you, I'm not, I don't understand 
uh, what time frame you're asking for. What day, what, what day did you start your part of the investigation? Well, we started the investigation as soon as he ran people over in the parade. And you were there? I responded to the parade after he had done that. Were you at the parade? No, I was not. So it would be fair to say you were on call? No, I was not. So it would be fair to say you don't know when you're a part of the investigation started then, right? It would not be fair to say that. You don't recall what time it was when you started your part of the investigation? As soon as I responded. And you don't recall when you were dispatched to respond? It's in my report. Um, I don't remember the time exactly, but it's in my report. And at that time, did you know the identity or name of any alleged suspects at that time that you were dispatched? At the time that I was uh, sent to the city of Waukesha, I did not know the identity of the suspect. You made reference to a report. Do you recall when you wrote that report, or did you write the report yourself? Yes, I typically type my own reports. And do you recall when you submitted that report? I have no idea what day I submitted the report. So when you were first dispatched, what did you do? I drove to the city of Waukesha and met with members at the <coughs> Waukesha Police Command Unit. And were you dispatched to any location from that point? I was not dispatched. Were you sent to any location from that point? I was assigned with uh, taking a number of investigators with myself and walking the entire parade route, going from establishment to establishment, bar to bar, restaurant to restaurant, and obtaining phone numbers and names of people who were present at the parade and who had witnessed something and would be um, followed up with later by a member of the Detective Bureau. So it would be fair to say you, you did some interviews at that time? Yes. Do you recall how many? No. <clears throat> and after conducting these interviews, what did you do? So at that time, after conducting your interviews and then going back to your home, did you have the, the name or idea of any suspects at that time? Yes. And whom were you told by? I don't recall.
do you recall who you submitted your typed report to? I don't understand your question. Do you recall who you submitted your typed police report to? No. <coughs> I'm assuming uh, your law enforcement agency doesn't type up reports and just leave them sitting on the desk. Would that be fair to say? That'd be correct. Any reason why you wouldn't recall who you gave your report to? Well, it's electronically submitted. And from there, does it have a specific uh, sergeant or lieutenant or captain or someone that it goes to from that point? If you recall or if you know? I wouldn't know. So it would be fair to say once you type a report and submit it, you're not sure who sees it? Correct. Would you say it's fair that because of you not knowing who your report is submitted to, that your report can be altered in some kind of way? Especially being that you don't know who sees it? Reports are done via PDF style um, reporting. It's uh, protected by my username and my password. And when it's submitted, um, it's usually not altered unless I request it to be altered. But it is fair to say that there's a possibility that it could be tampered with because you, you don't know for sure who all sees it. It's entirely inaccurate. How so? My report is accurate. Right? My report is the way that it was written, the way that I wrote it myself. So you've had a chance to read your submitted report after you submitted it? Yes. And to the best of your knowledge, is exactly word for word as you remember typing it. It is my it is my report. It is what I typed, and it is accurate. Word for word. Yes. Do you recall how many pages long the report was? Objection relevance. Grounds. Sustained. Not relevant. Please move on. Do you recall if the report was lengthy? Objection relevance. Grounds. Sustained. Next question, please. Grounds for the sustain? Relevance. And you, you stated that you read the report after you submitted it. Do you know how long it was before you were, were able to see the report that you typed? Objection relevance. Grounds. Sustained. Well, he already answered that. Then I'll object is asked and answered, Your Honor. Sustained. That question wasn't answered, answered but okay. I see, I see. Do you recall when when you typed your report? Objection relevance. Grounds. Sustained. Not relevant. How's that not relevant if he already answered that he typed a report?
Please continue, sir. Grounds for the substantive. Relevance. He answered that he typed a report. So how is it not relevant if he if he recalls <laughs> when he when he typed it? Please continue, sir. file any claim related to this matter? No. Do you know if anyone who did? Do what? Do you know of anyone who filed a claim in relation to this incident? No. Do you know who the plaintiff is in this incident? Jackson Grounds. Relevance. You may answer that question. Go ahead. Can you ask the question again? Do you know who the plaintiff is in this incident? Well, the plaintiff would be the state of Wisconsin. Is the state of Wisconsin a human being or an entity? Objection grounds. Um, sustained on relevance grounds. Have you ever had any interaction with the plaintiff in this incident? Objection grounds. Relevant, legally inaccurate. Grounds. Sustained as to the form of the question. Were you ever contacted by the plaintiff in this incident? Same objection. Grounds. Sustained us to the form of the question. Would you call the state of Wisconsin a living, breathing human being? Or That's entity? an answer. Grounds, because I didn't ask that question. It's not relevant. Sustained. Next question. It's very please. relevant. Seems like there's no plaintiff. Jury will disregard statements made by oh, the man. attorneys they, on, and the parties. They are slick. not evidence. Please Stop ask a question. Slick. So to your knowledge, the plaintiff is the state of Wisconsin. Do you see him present in the courtroom today? Objection. Irrelevant. Grounds. Sustained. Relevant. Can you identify the plaintiff, state of Wisconsin? Same objection. Grounds. Sustained. Sir, please continue uh, with and not on this topic. Next question, please. To the best of your knowledge, you're not even sure if you've ever even had any interaction with the plaintiff state of Wisconsin, correct? Objection, argumentative, Grounds. and compound. Grounds. Sustained. Definitely wasn't compound. Do you consider yourself an injured party in this incident? Objection. Grounds. Argumentative. The witness may answer. No. Have you read or seen the complaint? No. No further questions. All right. Thank you, sir. Any redirect? No. Thank you. All right. Thank you, sir. You may step down. Detective Rose should be dismissed, please. And yes, could we get the exhibit? Yeah, why don't you grab that exhibit and take it? That one has the exhibit sticker, correct? Yes. All right. We well, can keep it uh, by the state for now, and then later on it can be brought over to the clerk. All right. The state may call its next witness. Sir, if you would please make your way to the witness stand. When you get there, please remain standing. Raise your right hand, and my clerk, Teresa, who's on my left, will swear you in. Um, do we need this easel up? No. All right. We're going to have to. Yeah, or Detective Raglan can retrieve it. Yes. She's got to be right Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you, sir. Please remain standing. Raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear that the testimony you're about to give shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? 
Thank you, sir. Please have a seat. First thing I will ask you to do is to state your first and last names for the record and then spell each. Ryan Schultz, R-Y-A-N-S-C-H-U-L-T-Z. Thank you. Go ahead, your witness. Thank you. <coughs> Sir, how were you employed? I work for the Wisconsin State Patrol. How long have you been in law enforcement? I've been in law enforcement since 2014. Have all those years been with Wisconsin, with the Wisconsin State Patrol? Yes. What is your current position? My current position is the mechanical inspector for the Wisconsin State Patrol Technical Reconstruction Unit. Can you describe the duties of that position? Overrule the witness may answer. Um, my job basically is to conduct thorough and systematic inspections of vehicles that have been involved in crashes. Um, that can entail something as simple as taking photographs and looking at light bulbs to something more in depth or actually take the vehicles apart and actually look at the moving parts of the vehicles. Did you receive any training in order to perform those duties? Objection, relevancy. Overruled, the witness may answer. Yes. Can you briefly describe that training for the jury? Objection, relevancy. Overruled, the witness may answer. Uh, a lot of the training that I received was on the job from prior inspectors. Prior to this, I was a diesel mechanic, and in addition to that, um, I have ASC and SAE certifications. And not being in, having any interest in cars, what are those certifications? Objection leading. Overruled, foundational, the witness may answer. Um, SAE is for the electrical components in a car, basically, for the part that I am certified in. Um, ASE is for the mechanical components, which stands for the Automotive Service Excellence, <coughs> is what I believe it stands for. What is the purpose of a mechanical inspection? Uh, the purpose of a mechanical inspection <coughs> is to determine if there was anything that was incorrect, defective, or broken on a vehicle um, prior to the crash that would have caused the vehicle itself to cause or contribute to the crash. On December 6, 2021, were you directed to go to the Wisconsin State Crime Lab to view a vehicle? Objection leading. Overruled, the witness may answer. It's foundational. Go ahead. Yes. What information did you have prior to going to that location? Objection, speculative. Um, overruled, the witness may answer. Uh, the information that I was given is that I was to set up an appointment there to look at a uh, Ford Escape that had been involved in a crash in the parade in Waukesha. Did you go to that location on that date? <coughs> yes, I did. Did you do a mechanical inspection of the vehicle that you were sent to look at? Objection leading. Overruled, the witness may answer. <coughs> yes, I did. After <coughs> performing your inspection, did you draft a report? Yes, I did. And did that report containing the findings of your mechanical inspection from December 6th? Objection leading. Overruled, the witness may answer. Yes. I provided to you prior to you going up on the stand what's been marked as Stibit, State's Exhibit 83. Do you have that in front of you? Yes. Can you briefly um, identify it for um, how it's labeled, how many pages it consists of? Uh, what exhibit is that? Exhibit uh, 83. 83. It's the uh, Crash Reconstruction Mechanical Inspection Report. The whole report is Exhibit 83? Correct. Yes. The whole report. Go ahead. I haven't ruled on it yet, so go ahead and uh, ask your questions, Attorney Gacy. Sir, how many pages does this report consist of? Ten. And that is front and back sides? Correct. Objection. Overruled, the witness may answer. And on the face sheet of Exhibit 83, um, what information does it contain on that as it relates to this investigation? <coughs> um, at the top, it contains a case number and recon number, which match my name, the reconstructionist, and then it begins the report and um, vehicle identification information. And then on the bottom, it's marked with uh, Exhibit number 83. What car were you inspecting? Objection, leading. 
I'll overrule the witness may answer. 2010 Ford Escape. And what color was it? Objection leading. Overruled, you may answer. Red. And the license plate number associated with that vehicle? A. Adam, D. David, P. Paul, 9256. And on the report, um, the vehicle identification number on Exhibit 83, um, where did that information come from? The vehicle identification number I verify on the inside of the door jam of the vehicle. Um, it's There's two VINs on each vehicle. One's a public VIN under the windshield and one is inside the door jam of the vehicle. I always use the one inside the door jam of the vehicle first, take note of it, and then cross-reference it with the public VIN on the vehicle to make sure that they both match. And did they in this case? Objection. Uh, I have the 10 pages and nowhere on here does it say is exhibit. Nowhere on here. That's because it was marked for purposes of trial. It has an exhibit sticker now. So your objection is noted. It's overruled. And uh, well, the witness. I'm not privy to the same. Thing. The witness may answer the question. It's been marked as an exhibit. Go ahead, sir. Can you restate the question? I forgot what it was. I think I did too, but let's go with this one. Um, is the. The number that you saw on the door, you said that you cross reference it with the uh, VIN number, public VIN number. Um, did you do that in this case? Yes. And did they match? Yes. Okay. Does it give a drivetrain description on that first page or front page? Yes, it does. And first of all, I don't know what that means, but um, what is that? Objection leading. Overruled. The witness may answer. Drive train description describes the drive of the vehicle, basically how it's operated on the roadway. So in this case, it's an automatic, automatic transmission. It doesn't have a clutch. You don't have to shift the gears, and it's front wheel drive, meaning that it's not all wheel drive or rear wheel drive like a pickup truck. It's just front wheel drive. Okay. And there's, is there a picture on the front of Exhibit 83? Yes. Overruled, the witness may answer. Just a reminder to wait until I've ruled on any objection. Thank you. Yes. And what is that picture of? It's a picture of the 2010 escape. That you did the mechanical inspection on? Objection leading. Overruled, the witness may answer. Yes. Have you had, you authored this report? I did. Have you had a chance to review it since you've authored it? Yes. Is the information contained within this report accurate? Objection. Leading. Overruled. The witness may answer. Yes, it is. I would ask, I would move States Exhibit 83 into evidence. Objection. Your objection is noted. It is overruled. Exhibit 83 is received. So sir, is my sir. paperwork ever going to say Exhibit 83, or is it just going to be this? Mr. Brooks, I'll take that up outside the presence of the jury later, but we're going to continue. It was Go brought ahead. up in front of the jury. Mr. Brooks, we're going to continue with the questioning of this witness. What are y'all trying to pull over there? Mr. Brooks, please. This is no one's... The, the exhibit, to my understanding, has previously been provided to you. You have it. It's now been marked as an exhibit for trial purposes. Got something I don't have, though. Go ahead. That's not how it's supposed to work. It's supposed to be fit. Attorney Basie, I trust that this was previously turned over. It was, and I believe the defendant has a copy of it in front of him. Thank and you. Where does Please it say continue. Exhibit 83? Does it, it doesn't say that this was Again, going to be we'll used as Again, we'll take this up outside the presence of the jury later. It's not something we need to do right now. Go ahead and ask your questions. Thank you, Your Honor. And I would object and move to strike from the record any commentary that the defendant was making um, in the last five minutes. What was that? Court will strike the commentary that was made. I'm not sure if it was picked up or not, but as a reminder to the jurors, the statements made by parties and lawyers are not evidence. Um, the testimony and other evidence that's received is the evidence the jury will ultimately consider. Go ahead. Thank you. Sir, can you briefly describe the condition of the vehicle when you inspected it on December 6th? 
Uh, yeah, the vehicle had uh, quite a bit of front end damage. The uh, bumper cover was pushed back. The grill was pushed back into the engine bay um, and into the radiator. That was also pushed backwards in towards the engine. The hood was folded up in the air. Both lights were broken out of the front. Um, there was a quite a bit of debris and unknown things stuck to the exterior of the vehicle. Um, and there was also some damage to the sides of the vehicle. Do you know why you had to go to the Wisconsin State Crime Lab in order to do the inspection? Jason Levy. Um, overrule the witness may answer. I was requested to go to the State Crime Lab to do the inspection because they had not yet completed um, DNA sampling. So until they had it finished, it was <coughs> going to be retained inside the crime lab. So in the interest of not moving the vehicle again, once they were done with DNA, they had me come to the crime lab to do the testing. An inspection. So the first section of your report, and I'm just going to direct your attention to page three of Exhibit 83, um, talks about the tires and the suspension and tie rods. Do you see that? Objection leading. Overrule. The witness may answer. Yes. And can you describe for the jury what part of the inspection, describe this part of the inspection. Objection. Overruled, the witness may answer. The report's been received by the, <coughs> by the court, and the state may direct the witness to various points at its discretion. When was it made an exhibit? Because I wasn't aware of that. Go ahead, Attorney Basie. You may continue. Thank you. Sir, can you describe the information contained in the first section of the report under the heading tires, wheels, steering, suspension, brakes? Objection B. Overruled. The witness may answer. So under this section, it's broken down into four parts. One for axle one left, which is the driver's side front axle. The left side would refer to it as you're sitting in the vehicle facing forward. Um, the right side would refer to the passenger side. So axle one is the frontmost axle, axle two is the rearmost, left and right, and it breaks each individual um, wheel end component systems down. And then from that, I take each one apart and inspect them thoroughly, brakes, tires, steering components on the front axle, obviously, suspension condition, and anything else that's at the wheel end that I can inspect. And did you do that in this case? Yes. What observations did you make? Um, first, on axle one left, which would be the driver's side front, <coughs> the tie rod end was worn, um, about an eighth of an inch of play in the tie rod end, in the ball joint itself. So when you turn the steering wheel or turn the wheel, there was a little bit of play in the tie rod still attached, um, still intact, still functioning, still able to steer the vehicle, but just worn to the point that it needed replacement before it got any worse. Was that something that would create any problems in operating the car, for example, on November 21st, 2021? Objection is speculative. Overruled, this witness may answer. He's been, um, hold on, he's been qualified under 907.02. Um, I direct your attention to 907.02 through 907.07, Mr. Brooks. Go ahead. I don't consider to be in court that name, and that's referring to a specific date. How do we know that's not speculation? Um, the objections noted it's overruled. The witness may answer. It would not. The vehicle would still steer and drive just the same as any other vehicle. It would just have play in the steering wheel and it would make a little bit of a clunking noise potentially when you turn the wheel. You would maybe hear a clunking noise from that left front tire on. Again, operationally, the person driving that car would have any trouble steering based upon that issue? <coughs> not at all. Okay. What other observations did you make? Um, other observations I made were that all the tires were evenly worn on all four axle ends. Um, the, I believe it was the left rear, yep, the left rear axle, the tire on that axle was bigger than the other three. So there's also a chart referenced later in my report that shows the difference between the two. Um, the tires that are recommended to be on the vehicle are size 235, 70, R16, 
which was what was equipped on the vehicle, except on the left rear, which was 245-75 R16, which is one full size bigger in dimension and aspect ratio. What if any impact would that have on how a person's ability to drive that vehicle? So a one size bigger in tire is usually not the end of the world, being that it's the single tire, it can have an effect, but it's on the rear of the vehicle. Being a front wheel drive vehicle, the speeds are reported off of the front axle of that vehicle. So that's where the speedometer would get its speeds from. Um, the only time it would be notable would be during a heavy ABS brake application. And that would be at a higher rate of speed with full brake application where the ABS system kicks in on the vehicle. That's where it, would, it could be noticeable. And by could be, I mean, the sizes are very similar. They're about an inch and a half in difference. Revolutions per mile are not that far apart. The ABS system might not even pick up a difference between the two. When you say at higher speeds, are we talking, what are we talking? Uh, higher speed. <clears throat> Overrule the witness by answer. Higher speeds, I mean something like highway speeds, 55 miles an hour, 70 miles an hour or greater. Any other observations made with regard to in that area? The only other observations that I made were that um, all the brakes were in good working condition and had adequate thickness left on the brake pads um, for stopping of the vehicle. All four brakes were in good working shape and they were able to be locked at the time of inspection. So and I, I let me clarify if I didn't ask you this. Um, the information you were provided was that this vehicle was involved in a crash? Objection, accident hazard. Um, overruled, uh, given the nature of the testimony being provided, uh, the statement clarify that. So go ahead, you may answer. Yes. And did you, do you know the date of that crash? Uh, I know it was in November, I don't know the exact date. Okay, thank you. So with regard to the braking system, was there anything, did you find anything at all in your inspection of that vehicle that would have caused the brakes not to work or not to work effectively on the date of the crash, or prior to the crash? Objection, speculative. Overruled the witness may answer. No, I did not. Actually, since your inspection took place after the crash, would that be your same answer with regard to as it was on December 6, 2021, there were no brake problems? Objection, speculative. Overruled, the witness may answer. <coughs> that is correct. The brake still functioned at the time of inspection fully. What was the next area that you then inspected? The next area that I inspected was the electronic system. Um, and general cabin system of the vehicle, cabin being where the occupants sit inside of the vehicle. Um, I did that by examining light bulbs on the exterior of the vehicle and then systematically working my way into the vehicle where I could. What observations did you make in that area? Um, both headlights were, um, the lenses were damaged but the lights were still working. Um, the lights were in the high beam position and in the automatic position from the driver's cabin. What does that indicate? Objection leading. Overruling, the witness may answer. So that indicates that when the vehicle was left at the last time that the vehicle headlights were in the automatic position, meaning that if it's dark enough out that the headlights would turn themselves on and the selector stick was in the high beam position, meaning that the last time the lights were in use, they were in high beam mode. Thank you. Continue on. Um, from there, uh, just examine the throttle linkage, um, horn, and the other driver controls from inside the cabin. So let's talk about the throttle controls. First of all, what is that? So the the um, overruled, the witness may answer. Everyone's familiar with the throttle pedal in the vehicle. You press the pedal. And it makes the vehicle accelerate. From there on this specific vehicle, it's an electronic signal that is transferred from the throttle pedal to the throttle body on the vehicle's engine on the intake. 
Um, that electrical signal opens a butterfly valve, which allows more air and fuel into the engine, speeds the engine up. If you let off the throttle, it reduces and closes that valve. On this particular vehicle, um, I checked the throttle pedal first inside the cab. It was free moving, no binding, no obstructions. I was able to smoothly press it to the floor and release it, and it acted just as it should. Uh, from there, I went under the hood of the vehicle. On this particular vehicle, the crime lab asked that I did not open the hood just because of the amount of DNA evidence on the front of the vehicle. They didn't want me to come in contact with anything. So they asked that I not open the hood if at all possible, which on this vehicle, I was able to still access the throttle because of the way the hood was bent up in the air. I was able to actually reach in from the side of the vehicle and access the throttle body components through the damaged hood portion where I normally would not have been able to reach. Um, from there, I was able to look at the exterior of the throttle and everything was in clean, clear working condition, no visible damage, no visible issues. I removed the intake tubing from the engine and inspected the actual throttle plate itself, which was in the closed position. Closed position indicates either an idle or that the vehicle is turned off. I was able to then actuate the butterfly valve itself from fully closed <coughs> to fully open. And when I released it, it went back to fully closed, just as designed by Ford. Did there appear to be any problems with the throttle? No, there was not. I'm just going to, I know you call it a throttle, I call it a gas pedal. It's one and the same, correct? Correction okay. leading. Um, sustained us to the form of the question. Please rephrase. What is the difference between a gas pedal and a throttle? Nothing. Thank you. What was your next area? The next area I went on to was the uh, seat belts inside the vehicle. And then from there, I actually was able to test the vehicle for function. Did you then come to conclu a conclusion section of your report? I did. And is that starting on page 5 of 10? Yes. Okay. Um, did you check the power steering system? I did. And what observations did you make of that? Aside from the um, ball joint that was loose that I described earlier, the entire rest of the power steering system was intact and functioning properly. So there are no problems that would cause the car not to steer appropriately? Objection. Leading. Sustained us to the form of the question. Please rephrase. Did you observe any problems that would, did you observe any problems with regard to the steering? Aside from the ball joint, no. Thank you. Now, in your report, you indicate a gross vehicle weight rating. Did you see that on page 5 of 10? Objection, relevancy. Overruled the witness may answer. Yes, I do. What is that? The gross vehicle weight rating is the amount of weight that the vehicle can physically carry safely, and that number is administered by the manufacturer. So that includes people within that car, is that what you're saying? Objection. Speculative. <coughs> Overruled. The witness may answer based upon his training and experience. Yes, that would include all vehicle, uh, the vehicle weight, occupants, and cargo. And the curb weight, what is that? I mean, generally what is it now? Objection leading. Overruled. The witness may answer based upon his training and experience. The curb weight of the vehicle is the weight of the vehicle as it rolls off the floor at the assembly plant. And that's without fuel and um, coolant and oil and things like that. And it's a dry weight of the vehicle. It's what the vehicle itself with nothing in it physically weighs. Thank you. If someone had reported hearing a clicking sound while this car was driving in front of them, was there anything that you found 
in your report that would be consistent with a clicking sound being heard? Objection, hearsay. Overruled, the witness may answer. There was a lot of damage to the front of the vehicle. Um, it would be impossible to say what a clicking noise could come from, um, being as there's a lot of moving components under the hood with the belt pulley, uh, the engine fan, things like that. Anything could be stuck in a tire. It would be impossible to say if there would be a clicking noise from this vehicle. I was actually not able to drive it physically to test it. I was only able to just start it. Can I ask why you were unable to drive it? Objection. Huh. Overruled, the witness may answer. Uh, there's actually two reasons I was unable to drive it. One, again, with DNA evidence on the exterior of the vehicle. Two, there wasn't enough gas in the vehicle to move it. Okay. So the car was on empty when you, when you observed it? Objection, leading. Sustained us to the form of the question. How much gas was in the car when you inspected it? Um, Objection, leading. Ask the answer. Um, overruled, the witness may answer. There was a, the gauge read E for empty, and the notation on the infotainment center originally said two miles to empty, and then on the second key cycle it said one mile to empty. When you said key cycle, when you started it, what or when you turned the key, what observations of A did you make? Objection leading. Overruled, the witness may answer. So when I tried to start the vehicle, it was very sluggish. It turned over, but it wouldn't fire, it wouldn't do anything. And then it made like a hiccup sound, like it was going to try to start, mimicking basically a vehicle that's out of fuel. And when I tried turning the key again, then the vehicle actually did start, did idle, and did run like it was supposed to. Um, that's when I saw that the fuel gauge, the distance to empty gauge, went from two miles to one mile indicating that the vehicle was very much so out of fuel almost. And um, I recorded this with my camera and I tapped the throttle to do a rev test on the engine. The engine revved and went back to an idle. When it went back to an idle the second time, it then sputtered and turned off. Which would indicate what? It would indicate that it's not getting enough fuel to run correctly. Thank you. Now, if a witness had testified that when the vehicle went in front of them, they heard uh, a high pitch, like a rubbing sound. Um, based upon your examination, what would that be consistent with? Objection, hearsay. Overruled, the witness may answer. Um, there's a lot of different things that could cause that. It could be heavy acceleration from someone pressing the throttle on the vehicle. It could be noise that is amplified as because the um, engine bay is now open to the exterior, so you can hear the engine noises coming from the engine bay of the vehicle. Um, it could be an exhaust related item. It could be a lot of different things, to be honest. Okay. When you were doing an examination of the undercarriage of the vehicle, <clears throat> did you observe a muffler? No, I did not. I want to show you what's been previously admitted, Exhibit 73. It'll show on the screen in front of you, and I'd ask that it be published as well. Objection, leading. Um, Overall, permission to publish 73. Sir, do you see the, the picture that's um, marked Exhibit 73? It's not actually marked, but it is Exhibit 73. I do. What is depicted in that photograph? Objection. Speculative. Um, overruled based on his training and experience. The witness may answer. That it appears to be an exhaust muffler and a couple chunks of wood and overturned dirt. The muffler that's observed in this picture, would that be um, consistent or inconsistent with um, a 2010 Ford Escape? Objection, speculative. Overruled, this witness may answer and provide an opinion. Go ahead. By just looking at a picture. Overruled, the witness may answer. Yeah, all think all you can cross-examine the witness about that, sir. Uh, Go ahead. to, y'all trying to pull a fast one. It is a vehicle muffler without seeing the ends of it and where the inlet, outlet are, and actual measurements, it would be impossible to see what vehicle it came from, but it did. it is an automotive muffler. And sir, at the end of your inspection, do you come to a conclusion with regard to the mechanical fitness of this vehicle? I do. And what was that conclusion? Um, 
my conclusion was that the tie rod on the left front end of the vehicle that's responsible for steering the joint was worn and had been worn prior to the crash. Um, this is not something that just happens immediately or overnight. If it would have been due to crash damage that this was damaged, I would expect to have seen a lot more impact in that area with bent metal or distorted items. Um, the tie rods are very tough parts. So that to me indicates that it was worn prior to the crash occurring and the tire um, obviously unless somebody changed it in between the crash occurring and my inspection the tire was a different size than the other three um, prior to the crash and it had been driven like that. Um, I did not see any issues from the tire rod affecting steering as far as it relates to the alignment of the vehicle. Once things are worn and they start to get excessively worn, they manifest themselves in incorrect tire wear. Tire might chop or feather. That was not present on this vehicle. Um, had the left rear tire been an issue on the vehicle, I would have expected to see that manifest itself in an ABS, um, which is an anti-lock brake system failure or a trouble code in the vehicle. When I ran the vehicle and with the key in the ignition in the on position, there were no diagnostic trouble codes present on this vehicle indicating any issue whatsoever. And two things that I, I guess I need to cover. Do you check to see if there are any recalls in a vehicle in coming to your conclusion? Objection, speculative, and do we still need this exhibit? Oh, thank you. We can take that down and your objections noted. It's overruled. The witness may answer. I do check for recalls, yes. Were there any on this vehicle? There were not recalls on this vehicle. There was only an extended um, service warranty from Ford, which had since elapsed due to the mileage on the vehicle. Now you talked about the brake system in terms of the, the brake pedal within the car and it's, um, that it was operating correctly. Do you recall that testimony? Objection leading. Overruled. It's foundational. Uh, the witness may answer. Yes, I do. Now, when a, a person activates that brake pedal, what is happening within the car? Um, there's actually a lot of things that happen within the car when you activate the brake pedal. Um, when you press the brake pedal, um, it pushes on a, it's called a push rod, but it actually pulls on it. It pulls on the rod, which goes into the brake master cylinder, and that master cylinder is what pumps hydraulic fluid from the um, brake fluid reservoir to each independent wheel on this vehicle. It's equipped with anti-lock brakes. It goes through an ABS modulator first. Um, from there, it sends a signal out to stop or slow down, depending on the amount of pressure that you apply inside the cab. Depends on how much braking force you get at the wheel ends. Um, in a very heavy brake application, as I had discussed before, where the vehicle is still trying to uh, maintain momentum, the ABS system can override and that's where you would get the vibration in the pedal that many of you may have felt before. That's your ABS system doing its job, not allowing the wheels to lock themselves up. What it's actually doing is pulsating the fluid in the vehicle. And when you talk about brake pads, um, how do the brake pads, where are they located and how do they relate to the pressing down of a brake pedal. Objection leading. Overrule the witness may answer. So when the brake fluid reaches the each wheel end, there's a set of calipers with pistons. And those pistons actually come out and they act like a clamp and they squeeze the two brake pads together. They're located between the two sides of the piston and on the exterior of the brake rotor. And what that does is it creates a pinching motion and that pinching motion slows the rotation of the disc down, which is the brake disc, which is attached to the wheel hub. And that's what slows your vehicle. And just for the record, he was using his right hand uh, to demonstrate kind of a squeezing motion. He had an, and I would describe his hand in a C motion, maybe three to four inches between the thumb and the fingers, and then pressing together a couple of inches. Go Thank ahead. You. Are there any other components to the braking system um, in a car? Objection leading. Overall. There's a parking brake system in the vehicle. Okay. But other than that, so you've covered every aspect of the braking system in this particular vehicle, is that correct? Objection. Speculative. Overruled. The witness may answer. Yes, I have. Did you observe anything, anything at all, that would have prohibited this vehicle 
from stopping if the brake pedal had been applied? No. you observed or documented with it during or in your mechanical inspection report that would have contributed to this the crash shiz that this car was involved in objection I answer. Overruled, though, to my answer. no thank you thank you any uh, cross exam sir? During your inspection, did you see any bully holes? Yes, I did. Do you recall where? Back up. Do you recall how many bully holes you observed? I do not recall a number of them. No, I knew there were more than one. The ones that you observed, do you recall where they were? I do believe one might have exited through either the windshield or rear window and one was in the side of the vehicle if I remember correctly. And did you find any shell cases? No I did not. And you said you did the inspection on December 6th? That's correct. Uh, do you know if the if the vehicle had been uh, uh, do you know if anyone attempted to start the vehicle in between that time mm. of the crash in your inspection? Not to my knowledge, no. But you don't know for sure? That's correct. <clears throat> uh, you made reference to the left rear tire being... Uh, being bigger than, than the other tires? Yes. Um, can you give a little bit more clarity on uh, how that would affect the vehicle? So one larger tire on the vehicle would obviously make the vehicle lean ever so slightly away from whichever side is larger than the other. Um, in this case, the amount of difference between the two tires, it's about an inch and a half in difference in radius so in radius you get half of that amount in height so it would be about three quarters of an inch difference in height that amount of difference is not noticeable in a vehicle um, the other thing that it would cause is premature tire wear from one side to the other um, over time to where one vehicle that one tire might wear faster than the other um, the suspension might not act correctly because it's it's not at the same ride height anymore so Eventually over time those are things I would expect to potentially see from that each vehicle acts differently with different size tires on it There's no one size fits all So different vehicles act differently it to uh, to Having a, a bigger fitting tire Yes uh, you made reference to it uh, uh, to the uh, to a vehicle leaning away from the side that's bigger. Or Correct. Would that in any way create a slight pull to the vehicle to either side? In my experience, that small amount would not know. And you made reference to the high beams. Uh, I, I don't remember exactly what you said referring to the high beams. Uh, I guess you made reference to them being used at some point. The high beams were activated when I did my inspection, meaning that um, when the headlights are on, they were in high beam mode. The, um, selector stick was pressed forward for the high beams.
it, why would a vehicle use high beams? Usually a driver uses high beams to see better or to illuminate things better. So it, that would primarily refer to if it was nighttime? Correct. Would you say with your expertise it wouldn't make sense for a vehicle to use high beams in the daytime? There are limited uses for them in the daytime, yes. And what are some of the uses from, from your knowledge? Generally, um, the high beams shine brighter, so even with sunlight shining on them, um, other vehicles can see them. It's a thing that we use on the highway as law enforcement sometimes. Um, we'll use the high beams at a crash scene. We'll turn the high beams on so oncoming traffic coming in during the daytime sees that brighter light from the vehicle. It's just a little bit of a thing to help oncoming vehicles see. So, so it would essentially be for uh, identification purposes? Not so much for identification, no. Well, what do you mean when you refer to um, for oncoming traffic to be able to? More for visibility is what I mean, so that it stands out to the other traffic. It doesn't look like it belongs because the lights look very bright. It gets the other driver's attention, the same as the red and blue lights on the top of the cars. It gets them to notice that law enforcement is present. Correct. That's what I meant by ID purpose for them to be able to to see. Then yes. Were you able to inspect the entire engine? I was not able to inspect the entire engine. And what parts of the what parts of the engine were you not able to inspect? Uh, the only parts that I was unable to inspect would be down in the front by the belt pulleys area. I could see that the radiator was pushed into it, but I couldn't see what components had been damaged by that um, as far as like water pump or anything like that. Um, and I do not usually take the engines down, meaning I don't take them apart as part of my inspection anyways. Um, my main under the hood inspection components would be non-engine related aside from the throttle. You made reference to the water pump. Did you notice any water leaking? Uh, yes, there was coolant that had leaked from the vehicle. From the water pump? I don't know where it actually had leaked from, but I know that there was a lack of coolant in the vehicle. It could have come from a lot of various different places. It was no longer leaking when I saw it. It was empty. So you didn't actually observe it leaking? Correct. So it'd be fair to say you don't know where the leaking came from. That's correct. Were you told that the vehicle was leaking? No, it just has a low coolant level, meaning it leaked from someplace or it had never been filled properly. So at that time, it'd be fair to say you weren't sure if it had been filled properly or if it was leaking. Either is possible. But it'd be fair to say you didn't know for sure which of the two. Correct. Uh, you made reference to a loose ball joint. Um, can you give a little bit more clarity on exactly what is a ball joint? So the ball joint is at the wheel end. When you turn your steering wheel in your vehicle, there's a shaft attached to the wheel. It goes down to a rack and pinion system. The pinion is a round gear. The rack is a flat piece of metal with gear teeth on it. As you turn, it pushes the tie rods left and right. As you turn left and right, 
on the end of each of those tie rods is a ball and socket joint, much like um, the hip joint on a human being. It's a ball that fits inside of a socket and what that does is it allows the wheel to turn left and right as it's being pushed by the tie rod without any binding or any issues in between. That is clarity. I, I don't know anything about cars, so. And you said there was a loose ball joint? Yes, the left front was loose. And to what effect could that affect the vehicle? Uh, the amount that it was loose, it would only wear more with more use. Um, as those components start to wear down, they start to have a little play. The longer the vehicle is operated without proper repairs, the worse the play gets. Um, the worse the play gets, then you can start having issues with um, improper tire wear and so on and so forth until it gets to the point that it actually separates the ball and socket themselves will separate from each other. And then what happens at that point? If the ball and socket joints separate, um, you would lose steering at that wheel. The other wheel would still be able to steer. From your inspection, can you tell how roughly how long this loose or this ball joint was loose? I cannot tell exactly how long, no. I can say that it was loose before the crash occurred just based on the fact that it was worn, not broken. So with your expertise, would it be fair to say that that needed to be taken care of? Yes, that needed to be corrected. And you made reference to the gas. Um, the, the vehicle having difficulty starting. Would that be fair to say? Yes. And uh, reference to the axles, you, you made reference to uh, taking them off the vehicle? The axle I do not take off of the vehicle at all. Uh, what did you do in regards to the axle? The axle ends, wheel ends, that's where the brake components are mounted. So I removed the wheel and tire from the actual axle end. I think that's what I was referring to. Okay. I'm sorry if I misquoted. I know you made some reference to removing something. I, I just assume you meant the axle. Um, when you inspect the axle and remove, you said the wheel? Yes. Um, what, what is being inspected at that point? Um, so when I remove the wheel and tire from the vehicle, I remove all four of them one at a time. And that's where I actually look at the brake components themselves, being the brake pads, the brake calipers, um, pistons inside the caliper, brake rotors, um, and then I get a better view of the tie rod that I was just speaking about because it's actually next to the wheel on the axle end of the vehicle. You said the tire tire rod? The tie rod ball joint that was loose. Oh, okay. So what, so I think you just were clear about the ball joint and tire rod. Is, is there a difference between the two? Yes, the ball joint is the, the joint itself and it's on the end of the tie rod. Did you notice anything wrong with the tie rod? 
the actual tie rod, not the ball joint? No, there was nothing wrong with the tie rod. Just one second, I'm just looking over these notes. On uh, page nine of your report, and you did give some clarity to this, I'm just curious to know, on page nine, well, first of all, you, you wrote this report yourself, correct? Yes. Page nine, the second sentence. Um, I'm assuming you still have the exhibit 83. Yes, sir. It says, I noted a worn tie rod end on the left front wheel end. Was, was that in reference to the ball joint and not the tie rod? Yes. They're, they're one and the same. The tie rod end is a ball joint. It's two different ways to refer to the same component. Okay, I was... Clarity. It's, it doesn't say ball joint right here. Would that be fair to say? Correct. And what is the, the high mount brake lamp. The high mount brake lamp is on the back of the vehicle. You have the right brake light and turn signal, left brake light and turn signal, and then there's the third brake light that's a, like usually in the rear window or at the top of the back of the hatch of the vehicle. That's the high mount brake lamp. Okay. And it was inoperable when you inspected it? That's correct. Both of those were inoperable during inspection. So they didn't work? Correct. So it'd be fair to say if someone was viewing the vehicle from behind, they wouldn't be able to see be because those were inoperable. Yes, at the time of inspection, those lights did not work. You also stated that it, it is unknown if they were working prior to the crash or damaged during the crash. Would that be fair to say? That's correct. That you would you would know either way. No, I would not have a way to tell when that light bulb <coughs> went out.
No further questions. Right, thank you. Any redirect? <coughs> Before you do that, I'm just going to hold my jury stand for a second. Go ahead. <coughs> High mount break, high mount brake lamp were inoperable. Do you recall that? Yes. How about the left um, brake lamp? Was that operable or inoperable? Objection. Leading. Overruled. The witness may answer. The left stop lamp was working. Now, sir, just going back again to this ball joint, you stated that. I guess, was your testimony on cross-examination that <clears throat> unless the ball and socket is separated, you can still safely operate that vehicle? Objection. Mischaracterizes what was said. Um, based on the form of the question, I'll allow the witness to answer. Yes. <coughs> and the ball and the socket on this vehicle, were they separated? They were not. Now, your inability to fully inspect the engine, I want to direct you to that area of the vehicle. Does the engine control acceleration? Objection. Relevancy. Overruled. The witness may answer. No, it requires driver input. Does the engine control braking? No, it does not. Does the engine control steering? Objection. The um, overruled. The witness may answer. No, it does not. Does the engine control gear shifting? Objection. Relevancy. Overruled. The witness may answer. It does not. Finally, sir, you had talked about um, actually coolant or some type of water. I wasn't sure if you're talking about the water pump or the radiator. Do you know what was leaking, if anything? Objection. Accident answered during the cross. Well, overruled the witness may answer. It's redirect. Um, yes, yeah, so water pump, water coolant, it's all interchangeable um, as far as the cooling system for the engine goes. And the coolant system was low at the time of inspection and had been leaking, but from where I do not know. And again, does that control the steering? No. The braking? No. The acceleration? No. Finally, sir, you had talked about on uh, cross examination the presence of the high beams being on during the daylight. Do you recall that line of questioning? Yes. Specifically, you had indicated that sometimes the state patrol uses their high beams during the day. What was that for? Objection. That was, yes, sir. Overruled. The witness may answer. It's redirect. To increase visibility. Is that of any assistance if a vehicle is coming up behind people? Objection. Speculative. Based on his training and experience, I will allow him to answer. No. Thank you. Nothing further. All right. Thank you. You may step down. I will take that. Thank you, sir. And um, once the witness passes, I'll excuse the jury for an afternoon break. It's uh, just about 3.06. We'll take about 15 minutes. I'll rise for the jury. seated.
Mr. Burks, I know the last thing you said, I heard you say that's hilarious. What were you referring to? I was referring to, like, are you serious? This, some of the same, some of the same things that I asked on uh, when, when it's my time to question the witness can be overruled. But when the same thing is done and I object, it's not. It's nothing. It's just, it's just thrown. It's just thrown to the side. I just, I just think that's funny. Well, I sir, really do. I don't find it funny. Number one. Uh, number two. Um, You're not in my the, position either. The court rules on the objections at the time that the objections are made. I know, and I wanted to address this briefly. You can have a seat. Um, you had questioned during the testimony of this witness, um, Exhibit 83, um, because I believe what you were saying is, and you can tell me if I'm wrong on this, uh, the copy of the report you have does not have an exhibit sticker on it. It don't. Right, and um, the- Which, You wanna see it? I, I don't doubt that your copy does not have an exhibit sticker, uh, because at the time the report was provided to you, uh, and I'll have the state correct me if I'm wrong on this, uh, it would have been provided uh, through the course of discovery. I'd also note that on April, I believe 22nd of 2022, the state filed a notice of expert naming uh, Inspector uh, Ryan Schultz as an expert witness and indicated it that he would testify consistent with his uh, report. And then I directed your attention to um, the statutes in the rules of evidence dealing with expert testimony, specifically starting at 907.02 through 907.07. Um, that is why I didn't stop during the testimony to have a discussion outside the presence of the jury. Uh, because at that point, um, the objection to not having an exhibit sticker on your report is not, um, would not prevent the court from receiving the exhibit once the proper foundation was laid, which in my opinion it was, and the fact that your document didn't have that specific exhibit sticker um, doesn't diminish the fact that um, I know from your cross-examination, you were referring to the report. At times you referred to it by page number. It was clear from your questioning that you had reviewed it. I would just note two examples. Uh, you asked some questions regarding visibility and the impact of the high beams. That was one example. And then secondly, uh, questioning him about the ball joint and whether it needed attention and what that would mean. Um, and so that I just wanted that to make from the report, Your Honor. The only thing that, that came from the report was from page nine when I was trying to get clarity about why it said worn tire tie rod. Oh, and you actually questioned and the witness about the uh, different tire and what that would mean. Um, so I thought three uh, good areas of cross examination uh, that you covered as far as the other issues I think that you might have when there's redirect. Um, I'm not gonna explain what redirect is, sir, but again, for my position, um, there's direct examination, there's cross-examination. The state or any witness, any party that calls a witness always has the opportunity to ask the direct exam questions and then redirect based upon what's asked during cross-examination. Sometimes that does mean there's some repetition, uh, but I didn't see anything through the redirect of this witness that I thought was in improper. Um, so I just wanted to make a record of that. Are I am going to caution you, sir. Do you understand um, what I was you saying? You are, but you, during multiple times during the questioning of that witness, you were mumbling under your breath. Um, you say disparaging remarks toward the court, toward the witness, or toward the process. So if it was disparaging, what did I say? 
So you don't... say things like it's not fair or you go you make noises that suggest like you're disgusted with the ruling that is made. So you're assuming what I mean by that and when did Mr. I say Mr. Brooks, I'm fair? just making a record because yeah, but it's you're, important you're making an that incorrect record. It's important that you demonstrate courtesy and decorum through these proceedings and that you give respect to the witnesses who are testifying in the process. Um, Did the you, witness feel disrespected? Did the he, witness say anything about feeling Mr. disrespected? Mr. Brooks, I'm not going to engage in this I don't think back he did. and forth with you because, first of all, it's a mischaracterization of my observations, number one. And yeah, number but your two, observations are job. incorrect. It's if, my if it, job to ensure that the under 906.11 that there's the effective presentation uh, and I'll just refer you to that once again. I'll read it uh, into the record. You don't, you don't need to read it. Under 906.11, just make sure 11, that you make a correct. The judge shall exercise record. reasonable control over the mode and order of interrogating witnesses and presenting evidence. It's going to get addressed all every of the time. following: make the interrogation and presentation every effective time. for the ascertainment of truth, avoid needless consumption of time, protect witnesses from harassment or undue embarrassment. It go, sub two talks about the scope of cross examination. Sub three talks about leading questions and when leading questions may be used uh, to develop the witness's testimony. Um, so, with that, we'll take our break. I'll start the 15 minutes. It's 3 13. We are in recess. Thank you. Go ahead. Okay. Um, I did um, actually take note of um, when the court overruled one of um, Mr. Brooks' objections. His um, response was, stop name, trying right. to be slick. Yeah, I did say that. So, right. just for the record, I thought that that was very disrespectful. Thank you, I would agree. Mm -hmm. Judge, can we discuss scheduling at some point as well, either now or on the return? Well, we come back. Why okay. wasn't that addressed uh, right when it happened? Honestly, Mr. Brooks, I'm really trying hard because not to that, highlight that's the, your That's the definition of trying to be slick. During the trial, I'm trying my best here to I don't frankly see that. minimize pointing I don't see those it. things out to the jury and instead pointing them out it. outside the presence of the jury. You may have noticed I've even started to say I'd remind the jurors that the comments of the parties or the attorneys are not evidence so as to cast a broad brush and not simply highlight your conduct. I haven't noticed anything. And I, um, I but all right, we're in recess. To Thank you. What conduct you referring to? If you're not, if you're gonna be biased, then somebody.
Thank you. Please be seated. We'll go back on the record. <coughs> Do you want to talk scheduling? Yes, Your Honor. Thank you. Um, go ahead. Th and thank you for a little extra time here. I spoke with the defendant about his witnesses for tomorrow, and I believe he's uh, filling out the paper that I asked him to so we can get his witnesses here. I can tell the court this. I have two crime lab analysts to testify yet this afternoon. They're both here. Once uh, The next one is from the Milwaukee lab. The second one's from the uh, Madison lab. So if we could complete their testimony today, it would be greatly appreciated. I don't know how late you intend to go today or how long it will take, but I'm being optimistic. Um, our final witness would be a recall of Detective Casey briefly for some uh, follow-up matters. 
and then we would be in a position to rest. I don't hold out hope that we'll probably be able to rest yet this evening, but maybe, depending on how late you go and how smooth things move along. All right, thank you. I appreciate that information, and um, I appreciate the parties discussing um, off the record some of the issues related to the defense witnesses, so that's great to hear. Um, I'm planned to, I, I can go a little bit later tonight, and I, um, I would say no later than six, um, but if need be, if we can get through those two witnesses and Detective Casey, that would be great. Um, but let's see how we, let's see how we go. Okay, thank you. All right, sir, did uh, you have anything? Yes, I do. Um, Detective Casey already testified. What would be the significance of him testifying again? Well, let's take that up later. I want to deal with the lab analysts who are here first and not uh, delay their testimony any further. So, other than that issue, I, do you have anything else? Yeah, I, I thought he was released from his subpoena. At least that was my guess. Um, I honestly don't recall whether that question was asked of me. I know he's the court officer and he's been here. Um, I'd have to take a look at the record from when he testified and see if there was any reservation or have the state make an offer of proof and we can go from there, but I'm not going to do that right now. I want to have those lab analysts testify they're here and we can take up more fully the issue with Detective Casey um, after they're done testifying. So how late do we plan on going? I will go as late as 6 o'clock if need be. So I want to keep pushing along. I want to... Yeah, that's definitely pushing it here. That's not that late, sir. We have stayed till 5.36. I mean, Previously, there were times during jury selection we stayed till probably 7 or 7.30. On um, the position, last two nights, we did break at about 4.30, 4.45. And so... Um, I'm willing to go a little bit later tonight. So it's 3.30 now, was, we'll see how things go. That, I was making that for the, saying that on the record because in my position that is kind of late. Well, let's start now and we'll get going and maybe we don't have to go that late. So bring the jury out. Are we gonna address subject matter jurisdiction? The written decision that I previously entered is what I will stand on. I'm not gonna address it any is that, further. Is that verified proof? Sir, my written decision is the decision on is subject it, matter jurisdiction. Is it verified proof? Because it hasn't been proven on the record, and that was not verified proof. It has yet I to am be proven. De denying the request by the defendant to verify subject matter jurisdiction. It That's denied. It proven for the record. I disagree with you as a matter of law. The show jury's me, coming show out. Show me lawful law. All right for the jury. Show me by lawful law. Unless you make an attack of agreement that you don't have to prove subject matter jurisdiction on the record by law. It should be All right, welcome back, ladies and gentlemen of the jury. Um, it's about 3.37. I know you're all filing in, so I'll wait till you all get in. Not yet. And welcome back to the rest of you who are filing in after our... Uh, short afternoon break. I just wanted to let everyone know I um, have let the parties know if need be. Um, I'm willing to stay between 5.30 and 6 this evening. Um, I know there's two witnesses for sure the state intends to call and I intend to get through. It's kind of the timing and whether there's a third witness tonight or not. Um, I'll decide a little bit later uh, but at this point um, the state may call its next witness and the rest of you may be seated of course. Chris Johnson. All right, Mr. Johnson, if you would please make your way to the witness stand, which is on my right. It is upper riser. When you get there, please remain standing. Raise your right hand. My clerk, Teresa, who's on my left, will swear you in. Do you solemnly swear that the testimony you're about to give shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? Thank you, sir. Please have a seat. First thing I will ask you to do is to state your first and last names for the record and then spell each. My name is Chris C H R I S Johnson J O H N S O N. Thank you. Go ahead, your witness. How are you employed, sir? 
I'm employed as the Chief of the Office of Crime Scene Response for the Division of Forensic Sciences, Wisconsin State Crime Laboratories. What is your educational background and training briefly? I have a Bachelor's of Science degree in Molecular Biology from Marquette University. Um, I started my career approximately 16 years ago in the DNA Analysis Unit as a Forensic Scientist. Um, as a Forensic Scientist, I went through an extensive training program to be a, forensic, uh, a DNA Analyst, um, and I've carried many positions since then. And uh, as Chief of the Crime Response Unit, what are your duties and responsibilities? My duties are twofold. I have an administrative aspect and a technical aspect. The administrative aspect is to oversee and monitor all operations or all aspects of the Crime Scene Response Program operations. My technical aspects come into play when I receive calls from law enforcement to respond to scenes to provide technical assistance. My primary duty as the technical aspect is to preserve the integrity of the evidence at crime scenes. This is done through proper examination, recognition, documentation, and collection of physical items of evidence. Furthermore, another technical aspect I have is to write confidential reports of findings and this basically summarizes any examinations and processing techniques that are used on scene and is a summary of the findings from those techniques. Lastly, I testify in court when needed. Is there a set procedure you follow when you are asked to respond to a crime scene? Yes. What is that, please? Judge if, leading. <laughs> if law enforcement is at the scene and would like the crime lab crime scene response team to respond, they simply call the lab that's in their jurisdiction and basically the call will get routed to me and I'll dispatch a team to the scene. And on November 21 of 2021, was the crime scene response unit asked to respond to an incident in the city of Waukesha, county of Waukesha, state of Wisconsin? Yes. What was the nature of the call? The nature of the call was to respond to an address on Maple Street to begin processing a vehicle that was abandoned in the driveway of that residence. Were you given any limited information as to the significance of the vehicle? Yes, it was reported to me that the vehicle was most, more than likely involved in uh, running through the Waukesha Christmas Parade. Were you uh, aware that it was reported pedestrians had been struck during the uh, event? Yes, that was reported. Um, the objection is noted. I'll, I'll allow it as it is uh, foundational. The witness may answer. Yes. Now, when I think of a crime scene, I typically think of a place or a location. Does your unit also uh, cover processing of a vehicle like this? Yes. In this Overruled, you may answer. <laughs> in this particular circumstance or situation, the vehicle itself can be considered a crime scene in and of itself. And in your um, years with the crime lab, do you have prior experience processing motor vehicles that were suspected to have been involved in fatal collisions with pedestrians? Objection. Leading. Overruled. Foundational. The witness may answer. Yes, I've processed several vehicles related to that. Okay. Did you personally respond to uh, the address at 338 Maple? Yes, I was one of two people responding. Who else responded? Julie Avila. And does Julie work with you? She does. What's her task or uh, primary responsibility? Objection, Lee. Overruled, foundational, the witness may answer. For this particular scene, I was what is called the team leader, so I'm in charge of all aspects of processing the scene. Julie was a crime scene response photographer, so she was uh, tasked with appropriate documentation via photographs. Okay. Do you recall about what time it was when you arrived on scene? I arrived on scene approximately at 8.15 p.m. on 11-21-21. And I'd like to show you a series of photographs and 
I'm going to have multiple sets of photographs to go through with you. This is the first set, and the set contains uh, four or five pictures. So they're going to show up on your screen first, sir, and I'm going to uh, ask you to identify these photographs, and then we'll work backwards and uh, present them to the jury with the court's permission, okay? Okay. So first on the screen is Exhibit 67, which I believe was previously admitted? Yes. 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 All right. Objection. Overruled. Sir, do you recognize the objects uh, depicted in State's Exhibit 67? Yes, this is a overview showing the front end damage of the red Ford Escape that's parked in the driveway of 338 Maple okay. Avenue. Next, we're going to present to you Exhibit 93. What's depicted in 93, please? This is a close-up showing the damage of the front end of the vehicle, the Ford, red Ford Escape that's parked in that driveway. All right. I should have asked you this. Prior to the uh, photographing of the vehicle, is it been moved or altered by you in any way, sir? No. Objection leading. Overruled. Foundational. The witness may answer. No. Please uh, put up for the witness number 68, which has been previously admitted. Go ahead. Objection. Overruled. Please describe, sir. This is, uh, the photograph's taken at an angle, the front passenger side of the vehicle, but again, showing the damage of the front end of the vehicle. Number 102. You recognize that photo, sir? I do. Please describe. This is. Objection. Overruled. This is a mid-range photograph of the driver front quarter panel showing a side view of the damage of the hood and the quarter panel. And number 103. Please describe. This is a overall photograph of the back end of the red photo escape. Do you believe these five photographs are true and accurate depictions of the way the vehicle looked on the driveway at 338 Maple that evening, sir? Objection leading. I'm sorry, I was trying to get a hold of my witness list. Could you re-ask the question? Yes, Your Honor. Do these five photographs truly and accurately depict the way the vehicle looked at 338 Maple Street on the evening of November 21, 21? Objection leading. Overruled, foundational, the witness may answer. Yes. Move to admit 67, well, 67 and 68 are already in. So move to admit 93. 102, 103, and permission to publish all five. Objection. Relevancy. Noted, overruled. The exhibits are received, permission to publish granted, specifically um, 67, 93, 68, 102, 103. I realize some may have been received previously, but to be thorough, I wanted to put that on the record. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Johnson, um, 67 you testified was an overview photograph? Yeah, it's an overall photograph of the... Um, overruled, they're now being shown to the jury. It's proper, it's foundational as well. Go ahead. Yes, this is a overall photograph showing the location uh, of the vehicle, but specifically also showing the front end damage of the vehicle. All right. Next, 93. Please describe. Uh, a close-up. Oh, no. A close-up of the damage that has been sustained on the front uh, hood area, bumper area of the Red Ford Escape. Next is 68. Objection. Overruled. Mid-range photograph showing the damage, front end damage, specifically 
from a reference point of the front passenger corner of the vehicle. I observe on the bottom of that photograph there appears to be some liquid substance on the ground. Do you see that, sir? Yes, I do. Lady. Um, overruled foundational, the witness may answer. Do you remember seeing that substance that night? Yes. Were you able to tell what it was? Objection, speculative to you. Overruled, based upon his training and experience, he may answer. Not specifically what type of fluid it is, but some kind of engine compartment fluid. From this vehicle? Yes. Okay. Number 102, please. A mid-range of the driver front quarter panel, um, also showing what I describe as a white headband, headband on the broken driver door mirror. Is that illuminated in some fashion? Just yes. leading. Overrule, the witness may answer. Just a reminder to wait until I fully rule on the objection before you answer. I apologize. Yes. How was it illuminated? Objection leading. Overrule. It has white LEDs that are within the cloth and they're blinking on and off. Okay. And then last would be 103. Objection. Please describe. Oh, I'm sorry, he objected. Um, overruled. Go ahead. An overall from the um, further into the driveway showing the back end, the rear end of the Red Ford Escape. All right. Now, after these uh, photographs were collected on Maple Street, did there come a time where you planned to move the vehicle? Yes. Um, part of the process in arriving at a scene, there are three steps. There's a scene approach, scene assessment, and a scene processing strategy. So the scene approach starts with the moment I receive a call and start thinking about what evidence might be present, just knowing the limited facts or the limited information that I have during the call. When I arrive on scene, I do a scene assessment. So. I did a walkthrough of this particular vehicle around it and including the property. Determined from that what my processing strategy would be. So going back to answer the question, my thought and my processing strategy this particular night was to collect anything that would be fragile in nature off of the vehicle and then get it transported to a more environmentally friendly uh, secured facility to continue processing in the subsequent days. Was that for your comfort or for some uh, scientific reason? Objection. Speculative. Overruled. The witness may answer. It was very cold that night, so it, w it was difficult to, to process. It was very windy, but it was for a purely scientific standpoint of doing the necessary steps of collecting whatever I needed and I deemed fragile. Collect that stuff and then let's get it into an enclosed trailer and transport to a secure facility that's nearby. So what items, if you uh, recall, did you remove that you had deemed fragile? Objection, leading. Overruled, the witness may answer. There were first some items that were in the yards or yard of this particular residence, some examination gloves, and a winter hat that was in the backyard. So those items were collected. Uh, of particular interest on the vehicle was the headband um, that was around the <coughs> driver door mirror that was broken. So that was important to collect because during transport, that might leave, most likely would have fallen off. So that's what I'm talking about, fragile evidence. Okay. So that item was removed? Correct. Uh, what about the front bumper? We saw that laying on the, on the uh, driveway. Was that secured in some fashion? Objection, yeah. leading. Over you may answer. Yes, to make transport easy, the bumper would have had to be lifted up with bungee cords and resecured. Otherwise, as the tow company is moving that vehicle, the bumper, would just continue to go underneath the vehicle, further damaging or 
maybe even eliminating or getting rid of physical evidence that might be on that bumper. So were you the person that secured that front bumper? I, uh, I was there and I assisted with the tow company. Okay. Where'd you take it? So it was taken from this residence and it was taken to Waukesha County Sheriff's Office secured facility. <clears throat> Is that nearby here in Waukesha? Yes. Okay. Um, ask <coughs> Madam Clerk if you could turn off the display, please, and I'm going to uh, present to the witness only another series of photographs, starting with 105. Go ahead. Do you know how many? Eight. Sequential? Uh, Yes, 105 through 112. Thank you. Objection. Let me see. Well, I haven't seen them yet, so I'll have to wait, but you can put them up and then I'll make a ruling. I think we're ready on our end. We're just waiting for Madam Clark. Oh, yeah. oh sorry. <laughs> I'll leave it alone. You hit it. We just mixed each other twice. Five, 105. All right. Um, there. Given what I see on the screen, the objection is overruled. Okay. And, Your Honor, for the sake of time, I'm just going to ask the witness to look through these photos just as if he had them in front of him, and then I'll um, ask some foundational questions. So, 105 is on the screen. Do you see it, sir? Yes. Do you need more time to review that photo? No. 106, please. Yes. Do you need more time to review that photo? No. Leading. Overruled, the witness may answer. 107? Yes. Do you need more time? No. 108? Yes. Do you need more time? No. 109? Yes. Need more time? No. 110? Yes, I recognize, and I don't need more time. 111? I recognize, and I don't need more time. And 112? I recognize that photo and don't need any more time. Where were each of these photos taken? Each of these photos were taken at that secure facility that where Waukesha County Sheriff's Office, their secured facility is indoors at that facility. Okay. And do you believe each of these photos is a true and accurate representation of what the vehicle looked like once you towed it to the secure facility? Yes. <coughs> a move for admission of 105 through 112 and permission to publish, Your Honor. Jake Shane. <coughs> Noted. Exhibits 105, 106, 107, 108, 109, 110, 111, and 112 are all received permission to publish granted as to all. So in this photograph, sir, is the, uh, what's the condition of the front bumper, please? The Overruled, foundational, the witness may answer. The front bumper is secured in somewhat, should be its original position with those bungee cords that we previously talked about. Okay. Next 106, please. Please describe. Overall photograph, uh, the <coughs> front driver's quarter panel, including um, showing the hood damage. Was there an effort by you to try and match the pieces of the bumper to the frame of the body, or is that just the way it came together? Objection. Spec with you. Go ahead, you may answer. At this time, I was not trying to physically match anything together. It was just for the purpose of securing it for transport. Okay. What is the... Uh, position of the driver's side window in this photograph, sir? The window is down. Is that the way you found it? Yes. Objection. Okay. Overruled. The witness may answer. He responded to the scene where the vehicle was located and 
can testify based upon his knowledge. 107, please. Please describe. An overall photograph from the point view of the front passenger side of the vehicle. Next, 108. Objection. Overrule. Please describe. An overview of the front of the vehicle, including the front passenger quarter panel and the front passenger door. What position was the front passenger window in? Down. Is that the way you found it? Yes. Okay. 109. Please describe. An overall photograph of the passenger side of the vehicle. Um, including, including in this photograph is the front quarter panel, the front passenger door, and the rear passenger door. And uh, along the, the front passenger door and the rear passenger door, do you see anything remarkable? Objection leading. Overruled. Uh, spanning the length of both doors is uh, quite a significant scratch. Have you seen scratches like that before in processing motor vehicles, sir? Objection, relevancy. Overruled. I have. What is that consistent with, please? Objection, leading. Overruled. Coming into contact with another item. Thank you. Uh, number 110. Please describe. An overall overall photograph showing the rear of the passenger side of the vehicle, Spe specifically noting that the rear passenger window, um, that window is not down, it was actually shattered, okay. broken, um, and also showing in this photograph are two apparent fire bullet defects. Okay, I have some other photos uh, more specific to that in a minute. Um, thank you, 111. <coughs> Objection. Overruled. Please describe. An overall photograph from the vantage point of the rear passenger side of the vehicle. And then 112, please. Objection. Overruled. An overall of the vehicle from vantage point rear driver side of the vehicle. <clears throat> is the rear driver side window, what position is it in, please? That is up. And is that the way you found it? Yes. And it looks like there's substance on the exterior of the vehicle on the driver's side. Do you see what I'm referring to, sir? Objection, leading. Um, overall, the witness may answer. Yes, I do. Do you know what that item or substance was? Objection, speculative. Overruled, based upon his training and experience and his personal observation of the vehicle, he may answer. Not knowing what specific fluid that might be, I did do a presumptive test to see if it's possibly blood. Okay. All tests that I did of that liquid that's on the driver's side came back negative okay. for the possible presence of blood. And was it um, <clears throat> sprayed along the most of the driver's side of the vehicle? Objection, speculative. Overruled. Yes. Okay. Now, I'd like to um, move on, sir, and ask you. Did you do an interior inspection of the vehicle? Yes. And an exterior inspection of the vehicle? Correct. I'd like to um, highlight some specific areas, um, starting with the interior of the vehicle. Would you have processed the entire uh, passenger compartment and cargo space of this vehicle? Yes. And what types of things would you have been looking for, sir? Based on my former experience, um, looking for surface types that might contain potential DNA evidence. So specifically, anything that's in the vehicle that would have been handled uh, to control the vehicle or handled in a repetitive manner or with some kind of force. So for example, the steering wheel, the gear shifter, those items were swabbed by myself for the potential of DNA. We also looked 
at surfaces within the vehicle and process those for the possible presence of latent fingerprints. Do you remember uh, locating an object on the front passenger seat of the vehicle? Yes. Right, I'm going to ask that uh, we display to the witness only Exhibit 117. Do you recognize what's shown in Exhibit 117, sir? Yes, there's a hat that's on the front passenger seat cushion. Is that the way the object looked when you found it? Yes. Uh, move to admit 117, permission to publish, Your Honor. Objection. Relevancy. Overruled. Exhibit 117 is received, permission to publish, granted. Could you please, uh, it's a touch screen in front of you, circle the hat that you just described for the jury. And then uh, to your left, sir, on the witness stand, before you uh, took the stand, I placed an item up there that's been marked as exhibit number 87. You see that on the table there? Yes. Can you identify exhibit 87? Yes, this is the winter style hat that I collected from that front passenger seat. Okay. Like to uh, show another photograph to the witness exhibit 118, please. Objection. Overruled, go ahead. Do you recognize the object in exhibit 118? I do. Do you believe this photo is a true and accurate representation of the object as you uh, found it on the vehicle? I do. Overruled. Um, your answer may stand again. Just wait until I rule on the objection, please. Move to admit 118, permission to publish. <laughs> Exhibit 118 is received, permission to publish, granted. Please describe. This is a close up photograph of the clothing items that were pinned to the windshield <coughs> by the crumpled hood, and it was being held in place by that hood being pinning the items against the windshield as well as that wiper arm. Okay. Did you eventually remove these items? Yes. What did you find them to be? It was a detachable hood from a jacket as well as a winter hat. And can you just point out on the touch screen which is which? Objection leading. Overrule. That's the hood portion and that's the, the hat portion. Okay, thank you. Did you find any U.S. mail or paperwork inside the vehicle? Objection. Relevancy. Overruled. The witness may answer. Yes, I did. Were there any names associated with the U.S. mail or paperwork inside the vehicle? Objection. Relevancy. <coughs> Overruled. The witness may answer. Yes. What was that name? Daryl E. Brooks, Jr. Was there an address, if you can recall? Objection. Relevancy. Overruled. The witness may answer. There was, but I can't, I don't exactly recall it. Sure. <coughs> also on the table next to you, sir, is your report that I've marked as exhibit number 90. Do you see that? Yes. Whoa, whoa, wait, 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 wait. <coughs> Placed on the table. Go ahead, attorney Opper. Objections. How did it get on the table? Um, your objections noted. It's overruled. Um, <coughs> record will reflect that um, there's a copy of a crime lab report. It has an exhibit sticker, number 90, with the case number of this case. 
um, handing it back to the witness. Go ahead, you may question How did it get it. on the table? Who, put, who placed it on the table? That's, Attorney that's Opera objection. indicated she placed it there. When did that happen? Attorney Opera, go ahead, continue. Did you author this report, sir? Yes, I did. Great. If you uh, review the report, <coughs> would you be able to see the address for uh, Daryl Brooks that was noted in the paperwork from the inside of the SUV? Objection, I, I don't consent to being called that name. Please do. Overruled. Yes, I would. Please do that, sir. Objection. Overruled. Grounds for the overrule. The witness may answer. Grounds for the overrule. Go ahead, sir. The address for the pieces of mail that I recovered was 4014 North 19th Street, Milwaukee, Wisconsin, 5. Three two zero nine. Thank you. Objection. That should be strike. He, when he asked the question, he said he didn't recall. So how can you force somebody to recall? Um, the witness's recollection was refreshed through the use of his report, which he indicated he documented the address. Your objection is noted. It's overruled. The answer will stand. Go ahead. Next question, please. Yes, and actually, if I could back up one minute and ask Ms. Gussie, to put back up 117, you have to ask a question about 117. Go ahead. And if we could display well, it, please, Madam Clerk. Nobody got to answer no questions. Mr. Though. Brooks, please refrain from interrupting. You'll have an opportunity it, to ask I, your I questions. I have an objection of how, evident, how stuff got to the table without my knowledge. That, that should be known. That should at least be noted for the record. It was I noted wouldn't be, for I wouldn't be able to do that. Um, your objection is noted. It's overruled. Go ahead, Attorney Opera. Mm -hmm. So that needs to stop in, happening. In it addition to, to that. All right, I'm going to excuse the jury. All right, All right the jury. Can't keep doing stuff with, without. It should be a fair trial. That's my right. You shouldn't be able to do things without my knowledge. And then pass it off to the jury like that's fair. They deserve to know that too. As soon as the jury's out, I'll make a record. All right, Mr. Brooks, you are well aware that the reason documents that are name. being put on the I don't consent to being called that name. Are because this court indicated it would limit the movement of the parties due to your custodial status to keep things fair. And I merely asked, how did it get there? Sir, do not I'm interrupt not me or I'm you will forfeit your right to, to know be how present got there? in this courtroom. So you're holding me in contempt? Me. Are you holding me in contempt? I'm going to make a record. Are you holding me in contempt? I'm not answering your questions. So then you're not holding me in contempt? Do not interrupt me again or you will go to the other courtroom under what lawful law all right he's interrupted me once again um we're going to clear the courtroom he's being disrespectful i'll make a record once he moved unless you can promise me right now that you let me make my record without you interrupting me sir you gonna make your record you can make your record then please don't interrupt me don't hold me in contempt i've never said any such thing removing me for the courtroom your honor is essentially holding me in contempt all right. No, you're forfeiting your right to be present under Illinois versus I Allen. Didn't, I didn't forfeit anything. I will, I'm going to start talking, and if he interrupts, then I will close this courtroom, and he will be taken to the next courtroom. Mr. Brooks, you are well aware that the court made some pretrial uh, rulings related to whether there would be – they can stay in. I haven't closed it yet. He's not interrupting me. Whether the parties could approach the witness stand. And I did that because you're in custody and I'm not going to allow you to approach the witness stand while in custody. Um, that is why uh, various precautions have taken place uh, to limit, frankly, that from happening. Um, throughout this trial, um, there was one instance at the very beginning of the case where I allowed the state to approach a witness. I corrected that. That hasn't happened since. We've had 
Bailiffs take items up to the witness stand or the items have been given to the witnesses or they've been placed on the witness stand. That's proper. There is nothing uh, wrong about that. Nobody's trying to pull a fast one over you. No one is doing something that's not permitted uh, by this court or frankly under the rules of decorum and courtesy or the presentation of evidence in this case. Frankly, from my perspective, sir, your attempts and your comments are to try to dig in at this jury and to somehow create doubt about the presentation of this case or the fairness of these proceedings uh, without the party, meaning the state, having an opportunity to refute, explain, or correct it. I've taken the jury out at this point to admonish you that any further mumbling under your breath um, or not recognizing when I uphold or sustain an objection that I will take as a disrupting interruption meant to disrupt the proceedings. I'm not holding you in contempt. I'm well aware that that's one of my options. I choose not to do it for the reasons that I've stated on the record previously. All right, you can forfeit your right to be present at any point in time during this trial by your conduct under Illinois versus Allen. When it is disruptive, when it uh, does not follow the simple rules of courtesy and decorum, I draw your attention once again to SCR chapter 62, um, which has been previously provided to you, which is under the statute there. Um, these constant mumbling and interruptions for the, during the proceedings. I haven't made a record of them today, but I will now. Started at 9.01, then there was five at 9.02, three at 9.03, four at 9.04, one at 9.05, sorry, two at 9.05, one at 9.06, uh, three at 9.08, again at 9.17, 9.27, 10.31, 5 it was talking over by you at 2.03, five, interruptions at 214, 215, 217, at 219, um, audible muttering, 231, 233, what I would describe as inappropriate, like muttering under your breath, 235, at 306, there was the hilarious comment, at 311, there was what I would describe as arguing about the muttering and the irony of it all, at 312, there were four interruptions at 337, um, more 409, 410, more mumbling at 411, twice, and at 412, um, nine very, uh, different times. So I think I've made an ample record of the disruptions today. I've been abundantly patient with you. Um, I've, again, as I stated earlier, I've even limited how I tell these things to the jury about how to disregard, and I simply say the jury is to disregard comments and statements made by the parties or the lawyers as those are not evidence. So I'm warning you, do not interrupt again when if this jury comes back or when they come back and you do that, uh, then uh, you will be removed and you will forfeit your right to be present for the examination of this witness. Let's bring the jury back in. Well, well you might as well remove me then because you, what you're doing is, is, is not fair. I can't even rebut what you're saying. I didn't interrupt you. I let you make your incorrect record. Mr. Brooks, I'm bringing the jury out and we're continuing. We're going to get through these witnesses. It, it, okay. And I'm not stopping you through from doing that. Through your behavior, you're not going to delay these you, proceedings it, today. I'm not trying to delay continue. the proceedings, so I wish you would stop being incorrect on the record and saying what I'm trying to do if you don't know that. You don't Mr. know Brooks, what I'm, I'm trying to do. I'm bringing the jury out. I'm not going to argue with you. Then, so. then don't. Because I'm not arguing with you either. I'm stating facts. You're raising your voice. It's because very Because I'm, I'm, I'm tired of you always making a record. At me. You're making a record of me trying to look bad. I know what you're trying to do. It's not going to work. I'm making a record of what's accurately You're being making done a in record of incorrect statements. That's what you're doing. You're not making a record of Mr. not Rose, being I'm able. I'm advising you to be quiet because the jury's coming back you're out. You're advising me to be quiet? Is you telling I'm me to be quiet? I'm to be respectful when the jury Are you comes telling out? me to be quiet or are you asking me? I'm asking you and advising okay. you. Okay, thank you for correcting that because don't nobody tell me what to do. I don't tell nobody else what to do. I'd appreciate we're all you. It, we're all the dots in here. I've never told yelling, you to sir. do anything at all. Sir, I'd appreciate if your tone of voice would change. I, I would appreciate if you would ask me. I'm a grown man with grown kids. Don't nobody, ain't nobody going to talk to me like that. Nobody. 
I don't have a problem with doing what you ask me to do, not tell me. Just like when I ask you about subject matter jurisdiction that you have yet to prove on the record. But somehow I'm being intentionally disruptive. Of, uh, come on, man. Stop. Just stop it. Jury's right. coming out. All rise for the jury. Not going to work. Scared of getting removed or something. Thank you, everyone. Please be seated. Statement continue its examination of this witness. I believe we're on exhibit 117. Yes, we have 117. Madam Clerk, would you please turn the display back on? <coughs> Mr. Johnson, were there other items on the front passenger seat besides the blue winter hat? Objection leading. Overruled, the witness may answer. I do recall a cell phone being present on that front passenger seat. Do you remember what kind of cell phone? An iPhone. I also see uh, some items that look like maybe headphones or a charging cable, something like that. Do you see that, Objection sir? leading. Overruled foundational. The witness may answer. The exhibits previously been received. <coughs> Objection speculative. Overruled. I do see that. Do you remember something like that on the front passenger seat? Yes. Okay. And how about on the floorboard of the front passenger seat? Is there an item there, sir? Objection leading. Overruled. You may answer. Yes. What do you remember that item was? A TV. Okay. And to the left of the TV, the white colored object? I don't recall what that is. Okay. But this is the exact way the passenger seat looked when you recovered the vehicle, correct? That's correct. Okay. Now if we could please go to Exhibit 116 and put up for the witness only. Sir, do you see Exhibit 116 in front of you? I do. Do you recognize this photograph? I do. Do you believe this to be a true and accurate depiction of the interior of the SUV? Yes. Move to admit 116, permission to publish. Objection. Relevancy. Overruled. Exhibit 17, excuse me, Exhibit 116 is received. Permission to publish is granted. What's in the uh, photo of 116, please? This is an overview of the rear passenger seat. Um, that rear passenger compartment contained several clothing items and miscellaneous items. Okay. And uh, was the um, condition of the back seat like this when you found the vehicle, sir? Objection speculative. Overruled the witness may <coughs> answer based upon his knowledge of recovering the vehicle from the scene and his training and experience. Yes. Now for the witness only, I'm going to please ask uh, Ms. Gussie to put up 113, 114, and 115 for his review. <coughs> Go ahead. Is 113 up? Yes. Okay, do you recognize that item? I do. Okay. Next, 114. Do you recognize 114? Yes. And 115, do you recognize 115? There it is. I do. Okay. Do you believe these three uh, photographs truly and accurately depict uh, the vehicle, these areas of the vehicle, sir? Yes. Uh, move to admit 113, 114, and 115, permission to publish. <coughs> Exhibits 113, 114, and 115 are all received, permission to publish, granted. Please. 
jury would let me know when the jury box monitors are on. All right, thank you very much. All right, please describe 113, sir. That is an apparent fired bullet defect that's in the windshield of the Ford Escape. Is that the rear view mirror on the left side of the picture? Yes, this photograph would be from the inside looking through the windshield. Were you able to tell the path of travel for the bullet? Yes. Yes, speculative. Please describe. Overruled, you may answer. Yes. The, the fired bullet that caused this defect most likely was came through that rear passenger window that was shattered and entered the vehicle and then exited the vehicle through the windshield. So that's a ex exit damage that we're seeing there. Yes. How can you be sure? Windshields have laminated, laminated glass and so the directionality of a fire bullet going through laminate glass, there's an indicative laminate tag we call it. So that shows the direction of the fire bullet. Okay. Number 114, please. Please describe. That's an apparent fired bullet defect. I call this a striking defect. That's on the roof rail of the passenger side of the vehicle. Okay. Why do you call it a striking defect? It didn't penetrate any part of the vehicle. It was a more of a glancing kind of ricochet. Okay. And then uh, number 115. And if you could zoom in on that uh, back left. Yep, thank you. <coughs> Please describe. This is a, a, an apparent fired bullet defect. I call this a perforating defect because it actually went through the exterior door skin and went all the way through into the inside of the vehicle. Did you ever find the, uh, the fired round in the vehicle? Yes, I did recover a fired bullet and fired bullet fragment from the rear cargo area of the vehicle. Okay. Was there any evidence that that bullet traveled any further than the cargo area of the SUV? Objection, speculative. Overruled, based upon the witness's training and experience and examination of the vehicle, he may answer. No, the bullet stayed in that rear cargo area. Okay. Now, aside from um, examining the interior and the exterior of the vehicle at ground level, did you attempt to look underneath the vehicle? Yes, the first processing strategy, if we go back to that, I wanted to get everything collected from all sides of the vehicle and inside of the vehicle before putting it on a vehicle lift to examine the undercarriage of the vehicle. So you did do that? Yes. What kinds of things are you looking for on the undercarriage? Looking for anything that shouldn't be normally present on the undercarriage of the vehicle. So I was looking for any hairs, fibers, any potential biological fluids such as blood. Did you find any such objects? Injection leading. Overall, you, he may answer. Yes, I did. Did you collect those items? Yes, I did. You had described for us earlier um, swabbing of the steering wheel on the interior of the vehicle. Do you recall that? Objection. Yes. Leading. Um, overruled. The witness may answer. How do you go about swabbing a steering wheel, sir? Objection. What's the relevancy? Overruled. The witness may answer. The best way to collect DNA evidence from a surface is to use a two-swab technique. Well, the first swab is a swab that's slightly moistened with uh, deionized water and basically swabbing the surface and then following up that swab with a dry swab. So it's a two swab process, a wet swab followed by a dry swab and that becomes one item of evidence. Same thing for the gear shift? Yes. What do you do with these swabs after you collect them? I put them into the appropriate container um, and then seal that container, write my description of that particular item of evidence, and eventually that evidence is transferred to a unit at the crime laboratory for analysis. In this particular case, those items, anything for DNA, is going to be transferred to, to the DNA analysis unit. Did that happen? Yes, that did. And how about the uh, hat? 
States Exhibit 87, uh, did that get transferred to another unit for further analysis, to your knowledge? Yeah, so any clothing item that's Hold on. There was an objection. <coughs> Grounds? Relevancy. Overruled. The witness may continue answering. Clothing items that are worn by individuals are a really good source of transfer of DNA. So, yes, I collected that hat and it was transferred to the DNA analysis unit. Your report exhibits 90. Did you believe that to be a, a true and accurate narration or summary, I should say, of your work in this case, sir? Yes, I do. Move to admit number 90, Your Honor. Objection. Rather busy. Overruled. Exhibit 90 is received. I don't have any other questions then, Your Honor. All right. Thank you. Cross exam, please. You said you do DNA uh, analysis, correct? No, I. I did DNA analysis for nearly 10 years. I don't actually do DNA analysis anymore. So at the time of the incident, were you doing DNA analysis? No. So who did the DNA analysis on all the items that were found during your investigation? DNA analyst Trevor Nailit. Did you see the the results of those DNA and did you see the results of those DNA tests? We did have conversations. Did you see them? No. So it'd be fair to say you don't know what those results were. I didn't verify it. Like I said, we just had conversations. So do you know the results of the DNA analysis? In particular, is there a particular item? For any of the items. I don't recall the exact results, no. And you made reference to the uh, the gunshot that that you stated stayed in the rear cargo. Uh, where in the rear cargo did you find that shell casing? Objection. That's a misstatement. It wasn't a shell casing, Your Honor. Shell casing, fragment, same thing. Hold on. There's been an objection. I'll sustain the objection. It mischaracterizes the testimony and ask that you rephrase it. Did you find a shell casing, a bullet fragment? I found a fire bullet fragment. Where did you find the fire bullet fragment? It was really close proximity to where the rear latch comes down and hooks in to stay closed. So on the floor of the rear cargo by where the actual cargo door comes down. And you said a latch that comes down? Yeah, so how doors latch, like car doors latch, you know where the latch is? So where the rear cargo door came down and latched, it was in really close proximity on the horizontal surface of that rear cargo area. Did you observe uh, if, if the bullet fragment had struck anything? It struck some items in that rear cargo area. Do you recall what, what it struck? I don't. You made reference to a headband being on the um, the rearview driver's side mirror, correct? Correct. It was on the driver's door mirror. And from your expertise, how would you, in your opinion, guess that it got there? 
by coming into contact with something or someone that was wearing it. And do you know that for sure? No, but based off of my experience of a lot of years of examination of physical items of evidence. But it'd be fair to say that you don't know exactly. No, I wasn't at the parade. I wasn't. No. And you stated that you were present for the towing of the vehicle, correct? Yes. Do you recall at any time anyone uh, attempting to start the vehicle? No. And you stated that the bumper was, I guess, moved at some point so it wouldn't drag under the vehicle. I'm, I'm guessing that's what you said. If I'm wrong, you can. No, that's correct. Yeah, we, we used bungee cords to secure it off the ground so that when we're moving it or putting it on the flatbed to go to, to the actual enclosed trailer that it wouldn't be constantly going underneath the vehicle. When towing the vehicle, what was it placed on? Because of the amount of traffic or cars that were parked on the road, we couldn't, the towing company couldn't get the enclosed trailer right to the end of the driveway. So the vehicle was put onto a flatbed truck and then driven a few houses down where then it was transferred to an enclosed trailer and then removed from the scene. So with the bumper being that it was first placed on a flatbed truck, as you say. At that time with the bumper hat, what, what, what problem with the bumper hat caused if it wasn't going to be physically dragged or, or anything at that point? I'm not sure I understand your question. What, what kind of problem with the bumper pose if the vehicle was on a, on a flatbed truck? The whole point essentially, is, essentially what I'm saying is to give you more clarity, how could the bumper be dragged at that point? It was being removed from the surface of the driveway onto the flatbed. So if the bumper weren't secured in an upright position, it would be pulled and the bumper, as the vehicle is going this way, the bumper would be pulled underneath the vehicle. So once it was secured on the flatbed truck, would the bumper still pose any problem? The, the vehicle on the flatbed, the bumper was in a secure position. If it wasn't bungee corded, would it have posed a problem? Yes. How so if it wasn't moving? The whole purpose was to secure the bumper in place to preserve any physical evidence that might have been on the bumper. And you, do you recall who did the actual towing? The company is complete towing and recovery. And you stated to want to get the vehicle to a envi environmentally friendly, secure location? Yeah, a better term would be environmentally controlled. Uh, what, what do you mean by environmentally controlled? Proper lighting uh, outside of the elements outside of view of the public, so an enclosed building. Why the reference to outside of the public? It's easier to do examinations in a controlled environment. Would it be fair to say at that time, before it was told, the, the, the vehicle had been uh, secured, uh, checked, that was done, that was done out in public, so what would be the difference at that point? I'm going to go back to my original statement of what my primary duty is. My primary duty is to preserve the integrity of the evidence, so that night I was concerned with doing the necessary steps that I deemed relevant to collect 
and then get that vehicle to a more suitable environment just based off of how much more work and analysis and processing that vehicle would entail. Fundamentally, I follow, um, I follow what you're saying fundamentally. The question though is, by the time you arrived to the scene where the vehicle was located, were you aware that the vehicle had essentially been already investigated? No. So you had no knowledge that the vehicle had been secured, had been um, pretty much investigated by that point? Well, I was aware that the vehicle was in a secured state. I don't know what happened prior to that. It was very little information that I received on the initial phone call because of the hectic nature of everything. So I had an address and I knew that the vehicle was being secured by law enforcement. So law enforcement were present when you arrived to the scene? Yes. And at that time you had learned, no, uh, did you learn any knowledge from the law enforcement other than what you were told during the phone call? No. Do you recall who you were called by? I was called by Special Agent in Charge Dave Clabundy of the Division of Criminal Investigations. <laughs> Do you recall what time you arrived at the scene? I arrived at approximately 8.15 p.m. Do you recall what time the vehicle was found? I don't recall. Do you recall anyone telling you or mention, mentioning what time the vehicle had been found? I don't recall. So it'd be fair to say before you arrived on the scene, you have no knowledge of what's been happening around the vehicle. That's correct. You say you, you made reference to a hat being found in the background. Do you, do you remember saying that? Or in the backyard, rather, I'm sorry. Not the background, the backyard, I mean to say. Yes. And at the time that you observed this hat in the backyard, do you, from your expert opinion, do you recall it having any relevance to the vehicle? No, it was um, an item of evidence or an item potential item of evidence that just seemed out of place. So in that, those types of situations, I always collect those types of items. But you weren't sure at the time <coughs> if it had any involvement with the actual vehicle? No. Was there anything significant that stood out about the hat? Just the location. Did you find any blood on the hat? Did you find, or is it just pretty much just a hat in the backyard? I didn't do a thorough, thorough examination of the hat. So as far as you, you were concerned, you, you, it was basically just taking in evidence as a precautionary thing or? Yeah, it was an item that just seemed out of place. So I collected that hat. <laughs> Did you at any time obtain knowledge about the relevancy of that? No. <clears throat> All the uh, photographs that you were shown, had you seen those photographs before today? Yes. Do you recall if they were taken the same night of your investigation or multiple nights or days, rather? There were multiple days. And do you recall why you had to, or do you recall why those photos had to be taken over a multiple day span? 
Yes, the vehicle needed a comprehensive evaluation or processing examination of pretty much every single side and surface of that vehicle. And to do that uh, photograph wise would have took days? Yes. So when did you start uh, when did you start actually uh, doing an investigation of the items inside of the vehicle? That would have been the 22nd, November 22nd. So the next, the next day? Correct. And so did you yourself do uh, analysts of the outside of the vehicle? Yes. Same day, 22nd of November? Yes. So you kind of started the outside and the inside pretty much roughly at the same time? Yes. Do you recall how long you, uh, your complete investigation took? Mine along with my colleagues? Yours. Mine. The examination itself of just me examining the vehicle? Just you. Probably over 40 hours. And that does not include the report that I'm writing. It doesn't include the process of going through the report, everything. But my examination, at least 40. And so I'm assuming you did the report after you completed the initial investigation part. Yes, the report's a summary of my processing. And define summary. What do you mean by summary? It pulls everything together. It details my examinations and any findings I have from those examinations. I always view summary as not every detail, but pretty much like Uh, it's, it's, it's much as would be relevant, but not every single detail. Would that be fair to say? This report is comprehensive in the terms of it lists every single item that was collected. So why would you refer to it as a summary? It's a summary of the examination and processing. That's the best way to describe it. It's not a dictation. In other words, what do you mean by there, dictation? There are other reports that other agencies may do that are dictated, right? They're this, I did this, then I did this, then I did this. This is a summary. This isn't a dictated report. So, what exactly did you summarize in your report? My examination and processing strategies that I used, and the items of evidence collected, and any relevant findings associated with those <coughs> examinations. Did you do any examination of the cell phones? No, I collected those and transferred those to a detective with the Waukesha Police Department. Do you recall who that detective was? David, his last name is spelt, I believe, F-O-Y-E-N, Foyen. So at the time that you turned the phone phones over, did you do any do any more work in regards to the phones? No. Do you recall doing any uh, investigation on the airbag control module? I did no, I don't do that. Do you recall obtaining a search warrant to conduct an inspection on the uh, ACM? I'm sorry, no. Understand. An inspection of what? Uh, the the ACM. I guess that would be the 
air control module, I'm guessing that's what that's Thank you. Re referencing. No, since I don't do that type of analysis or examination, I didn't obtain any search warrant with that. Any reason why I would say that in the paperwork? Objection vague. Grounds. Sustained as to the form of the question. <clears throat> as to what paper your paperwork you're referring to. Uh I'm guessing I don't know what the what it will be called, but it says conclusion inspection summary. And, and the conclusion inspection, inspection or conclusion slash inspection summary. Do you recall? Is it from this witness? Huh? Is it from this witness? Yeah. Okay. Go ahead. Go ahead. I don't think that is from this witness, John. I don't see anything like that in this Exhibit 90. Are you perhaps still looking at Inspector Schultz's report from the State Patrol, the last witness? Uh, what page number do you have? And I'll take a look at 90 and I'll compare. This says uh, page 5. Yeah, he's looking at uh, the last exhibit from Inspector Schultz, 83. Well, it says Chief Christopher Johnson. Oh, it does say that in 83. Yeah, it says, if I can read for completeness, or you can, it says, upon arrival, I met with crime scene chief Christopher Johnson from the Wisconsin State Crime Lab. No, Camp. no, no, no. That's not what I'm reading from. Okay. Chief Johnson had obtained a search warrant to conduct the mechanical inspection and to image the data retained within the escape's airbag control module ACM. Yes. Correct? Yes. Okay. So that was written by Inspector Schultz, who just testified, not this witness. To clarify the record. <coughs> I apologize for that. It's all in the same paperwork with uh, Chief Johnson, so I, maybe that's where the confusion comes in. The record would reflect this witness. His last name is Johnson, so I think that's understandable. Yeah, I, I, I didn't know. I was just reading what I have here. Fair enough. Keep going. Do you recall at any time obtaining any type of search warrants pertaining to the vehicle in this incident? Yes, I have obtained a copy of the search warrant. And do you remember what that uh, search warrant was was for? What, what was the intended search? I uh, searched the vehicle and process it for any biological fluids, hairs, fibers, any electronic equipment, any personally identifying information. And uh, the, the, the ACM would, would fall under the lines of uh, the mechanical side of? Yes. At any time during your inspection, did you 
observe anyone try to start the the vehicle? When I was with investigator Schultz, when he came to my laboratory, he attempted to start it. And after uh, you, you already st stated that your initial part of your investigation before before the report uh, totaled 40 hours. And at that time, after you had completed your report, did you do any more investigating in regards to the vehicle? After my report was complete? Yeah, after, after you had done uh, the 40 hours uh, that you stated with and then the actual report. No, once my report's done, I didn't do any further examination of the vehicle. And after that was completed, had you uh, received any follow-up from law enforcement at, after you had completed everything? No. Had you yourself followed up with law enforcement about the investigation after you completed your initial part? No. You yourself didn't file any claims in this matter, did you? No. Do you know of anyone who filed any claims in this matter? I don't. And do you recall who you were subpoenaed by to testify? I was subpoenaed by District Attorney Sue Opper. Do you recall when that was? I believe it was sometime. I don't exactly recall when. And did you did you follow up on that subpoena? No. After you had received it. No. Have you at any time seen or read any complaints in, in regards to this incident? No. Do you know who the plaintiff is in this matter? The state of Wisconsin. Would you label that as a person, an actual human? Objection. Grounds? Sustained. Not relevant. You ever actually seen the plaintiff in this matter? Objection. 
Objection. Grounds. Sustained. <clears throat> If you saw the plaintiff, would you be able to identify the plaintiff? Objection irrelevant. Sustained. Pursuant to 9611, <coughs> sir, please move on to a different line of questioning. Just trying to establish who the plaintiff is, Your Honor. Do you see the plaintiff present in court today? Objection, irrelevant. Sustained. Would you consider yourself to be an injured party in this matter? No. No further questions. Thank you. Any redirect? Uh, just very briefly, uh, Mr. Johnson, you said when you arrived on Maple Street there were police officers present? That's correct. And you said the vehicle was secure at that point? Correct. Objection. What do you mean? Leading. Um, the answer may stand. Next question. Overruled. What do you mean by that, sir? The perimeter was secured with crime scene tape, and there were officers that were standing at the location where the vehicle was. Was it, would it have been possible for a member of the public or any curious person to just walk up and touch the vehicle or do anything to the vehicle? Objection. Speculative. Uh, based upon his training and experience, he may answer. Overruled. <coughs> they would have been stopped by law enforcement. Thank you. That's all I have. All right. Thank you, sir. You may step down. <clears throat> well, he's stepping down. If my jurors and anyone else in the courtroom want to stand, I do want to get through one more witness tonight. <coughs> and, and then uh, the exhibits that Mr. Johnson has, Your Honor, what would you like done with those? Uh, I'll take them. All right. Uh, I have 90 and 87. Yes. <coughs> what was 87? Eighty-seven is a hat. I'm not sure yeah. if I did move that, but I would move that into evidence, so we will need that item for the next witness. Okay, I'll put that back. Thank you. Um, Objection to that. that um, no, before you should, before you showed me that, I didn't even see what that was. If you would have never told, I know, but if you never would have told me, I never would have even know what that was, and I didn't see it until you just moved it. The witness had it up on the stand, but here it is. It's exhibit, marked as exhibit 87. Go ahead and set. State has moved it into evidence. I believe there's an objection. Yes, noted. there is an objection. Um, overruled based upon the testimony of the prior witness. It is received. And who do we have coming up to the stand? Your Honor, the state next calls Trevor Nalid. And for the record, he was handed a copy of exhibit 91 on his way to the witness stand. <coughs> Thank you. Sir, could you please stand and raise your right hand? My clerk, Teresa, will swear you in. Do you solemnly swear that the testimony you're about to give shall be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? Thank you. Be seated. And just for the record, what is 91? I know you're going to get to it, but... Oh, 91 is Mr. Nadelid's report, Your Honor. All right. Thank you. Then, all right, good, I guess, evening, sir. Uh, the first thing I will have you do is to state your first and last names for the record and then spell each, please. Sure. My name is Trevor Nalid, T-R-E-V-O-R-N-A-L-E-I-D. Thank you. Go ahead. Thank you, and I'm sorry for mispronouncing your name. Uh, <laughs> sir, where do you work? Uh, I am employed by the Wisconsin Department of Justice at the State Crime Laboratory in Madison. And what is your position there? I'm a senior forensic, senior forensic scientist in the DNA analysis unit. How long have you worked there? Eleven and a half years. Uh, could you please describe the work you do there? Sure. I examine evidence for the presence of biological fluids such as blood, semen, and saliva, and then attempt to extract the DNA from those items. 
Um, from there, I will make comparisons to standards from known individuals in the case. And what's your uh, educational background, please? I have a bachelor's degree from the University of Wisconsin La Crosse in biochemistry and a master's degree from the University of Florida in forensic DNA and serology. Do you have any uh, training specific for your position at the Wisconsin State Crime Lab? I do, yes. Please describe that for the jury. I underwent approximately a one year long internal training program uh, that included the screening techniques we use, uh, presumptive and confirmatory tests for blood, semen, and saliva. <coughs> Excuse me. From there, I learned the extraction techniques, quantitation, amplification, and typing methods that our lab uses. From there, I learned data interpretation as well as statistical analysis. Did you do any uh, casework while you were in training? Uh, mock cases. Okay. I, I completed two competence, two competency tests, two mock cases, a mock court, and then after completing those, I completed an extensive written exam as well as statistical tests. Did you actually uh, work with DNA samples, uh, processing and analyze DNA samples during your training? I did, yes. About how many times? Uh, about 175 samples. Is the Wisconsin State Crime Lab accredited? Yes, it is. What does that mean? Um, our lab's accredited under the ISO 17025-2017. Essentially, it's just a um, voluntary program that any lab can enter to show that it meets established standards. Uh, they control our proficiency testing that's done twice a year. Do you personally have any certification or um, accreditation, personally? No, just the lab accreditation. Just the lab, okay. Um, how many forensic DNA cases have you worked? Uh, just over 500. And about how many DNA samples have you processed? Over 2,000. Overruled, the witness may answer. I'm sorry, will you repeat your answer? Over 2,000. Have you previously testified in court before? Injection relevancy. Um, overruled, the witness may answer. As a reminder, uh, there may be objections. Please <coughs> wait until I rule on those objections until you answer. Go ahead, you may answer. Thank you. Um, I'd like to uh, ask you a little bit further about DNA analysis and how that works, okay? Sure. Um, what is DNA? We hear a lot about it, what is it? DNA stands for deoxyribonucleic acid. Uh, it's essentially the genetic blueprint that makes us what we are. Uh, it codes for us to have two legs, two arms, hair color, eye color, etc. And where's DNA found in the human body? Injection of eating. Overruled, foundational, the witness may answer. DNA is found in the nucleus of a cell. Is it the same in every cell throughout the body? In every cell that has a nucleus, yes, such as uh, white blood cells and skin cells. And is that important in your analysis? Objection yeah. leading. Overruled, foundational, you may answer. Yes, it is. Why? Objection um, leading. Overruled, go ahead. It's important because we can take samples, evidentiary samples that may be from blood or saliva and compare them with uh, known standards, which are typically buccal swabs, which are uh, swabs from the inside of the cheek, or dried blood standards in the case. Does each individual have unique DNA? Everybody except identical twins is unique. Okay. Are you familiar with uh, something known as STR analysis? Objection leading. Overruled, foundational, the witness may answer. Yes, I am. What is STR analysis, please? STR stands for short tandem repeat analysis. Um, over 99% of DNA is the same from person to person. So we're looking at that 1% that varies from individual to individual. Um, short tandem repeats are very small sequences of DNA that repeat over and over. So at one location, I may have 12 of these repeats where another individual may have 14. Is that distinction important? Yes. Why? Um, we can type standards from 
anybody associated with the case and make comparisons from the evidentiary profile to the standards to either include or exclude <coughs> individuals. All right. Um, I'd like to direct your attention to Exhibit 91. Do you have that item in front of you, sir? Yes, I do. What is 91, please? Uh, 91 is my confidential report of laboratory findings dated April 29th, 2022. And uh, do you know um, if it relates to events occurring in the city of Waukesha <coughs> on November 21 of 21? Objection leading. Overruled foundational, the witness may answer. Yes, it does. Okay. Were you given um, some items to process for DNA analysis? I was, yes. Were you given DNA standards to compare any profiles that you may develop uh, with, from the evidence to known individuals in the case? Yes, I was. Do you remember who you got standards from? I do. Are you able to name them? Or if you need to refer to your report, you may, but just let us know. Okay, uh, can I read off the report? You may read off your report. What page are you reading from, sir? I will be reading <coughs> page two. Okay, go ahead. Objection. Overruled, the witness may do so. I received buckle swabs, so cheek swabs from Erica Patterson as well as Darrell Brooks. I received dried blood standards from Wilhelm Hospital, Tamara Durand, Jane Kulik, Leanna Owen, Virginia Sorensen, and Jackson Sparks. Is there a difference between those two, uh, the method in which they were submitted, the buckle swab versus the dried blood standard? Objection leading. Um, overruled foundational, the witness may answer. Yes. Are you able to do the same thing with them? I am, yes. And what is that? Um, just extracting the DNA off them to essentially put a profile to the individual. Okay. And uh, how do you use those profiles that you develop from the known standards? Uh, we compare them to the evidentiary profiles that we develop. All right. Now you process many items related to this case. Is that correct, sir? Objection leading. <coughs> Overruled foundational, the witness may answer. Yes, I did. I'm gonna direct your attention to just a few select items for my purposes, okay? Um, on page seven of your report, Exhibit 91, you have reported on uh, analysis you were able to perform on some <coughs> swabs from the steering wheel of the vehicle in question. Is that correct, sir? That's correct. And uh, the swabs were obtained by another member of the crime lab, is that right? Objection, speculative. Um, overruled, the witness may answer. That's correct. How do they get to you? Uh, they were collected by analyst Chris, or, uh, our chief now, uh, Chris Johnson in Milwaukee, and they were mailed over to the Madison lab. Okay. Were you able to develop any DNA profiles from the swabs of the steering wheel in this case? Yes, I was. What were your findings? Uh, it was a two-person mixture with at least one male. Can you explain for the jury what that means, please? Uh, we can look at a profile and based on how many peaks there are at uh, different locations, uh, each person will have a maximum of two. So if you have three peaks at a location, you know that you have more than one person there. And so in this case, uh, we were able to say that it was a two-person mixture. Were you able to identify who those two people would be? Um, Objection, speculative. Overruled. The witness may answer based upon training, experience, and investigation and analysis in this case. Uh, yes. How did you do that, sir? Uh, I ran it through this program called StarMix. Is that a computer program? Yes, it is. What is that, please? Objection. Leading. Overruled. The witness may answer. StarMix is a mixture deconvolution software that we use uh, previously. Um, it was pretty difficult to distinguish different contributors and mixtures, and now we have this software that's actually a, a two-part um, program to do that. How does it work? Objection uh, leading. Overruled. You may answer, sir. The first part takes inputs 
by the analysts, such as a uh, number of contributors. So we'll look at the profile and determine that. But it also looks at the total amount of DNA amplified and essentially makes its own um, profile for comparison purposes. It will then compare it to the actual profile and determine if it's a good enough match. It will then generate another completely random profile and if it's better and a better match, it will accept it. If it's not, it will um, deny it and it will keep doing the accept over and over hundreds of thousands of times until it has a profile that is a very, very good match to the theoretical profile. Safe to say a human being would be very challenged to do the same analysis. It would take a very long time, yes. Okay. And uh, the software that you use, the STAR mix or STR mix, uh, is that used in other labs around the country, sir? Objection speculative. I um, don't know it's used around the country. Overruled, the witness may answer. Yes, it is. Is it uh, a reliable method of performing DNA analysis, in your opinion, sir? Yes, it is. Has it been accepted in uh, courts and other cases? Objection speculative. Overruled, the witness may answer. Yes, it has. More than once? Objection, leading. Overruled, you may answer. Yes. Do you know about how many times Star Mix has been used in Wisconsin courts? Objection, speculative. Overruled, the witness may answer. Since we brought it online in January of 2020, it's been accepted over 100 times in the state of Wisconsin. Did you have to receive some specific training in how to utilize this software? Yes, I did. And did you, uh, you complete the courses? Yes, I did. Did you use StarMix to analyze uh, the DNA profile, this two-person mixture from the steering wheel of the Ford Escape? Objection, leading. Overruled, foundational, the witness may answer. Yes, I did. What conclusion did you draw? Um, based on it being a two-person mixture, uh, Erica Patterson and Darrell Brooks are both very strong support for inclusion. They're both Greater, or it's at least one quadrillion times more likely to observe the DNA profile if it's a mixture resulting from um, them plus an unknown uh, over two unknowns. So the odds of it being Mr. Brooks' DNA versus some other random person in the world are very, very rare, correct? Objection leading, and I don't consent to being called that name. The objection is noted. I'll sustain the objection as to the form of the question. Just ask that you rephrase. Can you explain for us what you mean by very strong support for inclusion? Yeah, we have a verbal qualifier based off of the validation that the company, the StarMix creators, as well as an internal validation have come up with. And um, the highest number we'll report is greater than one quadrillion. So this is higher than the number than, we're reporting greater than one quadrillion, but the number is actually higher than that. Okay. I'd like to move on then to the um, gear shift. Did you receive swabs from the gear shift of the red SUV? Yes, I did. Were you able to develop a DNA profile from the swab from the gear shift? Yes, I was. What did you find? Uh, that was a three-person mixture, also with at least one male. <coughs> I'm sorry, you trailed off at the end. A three-person mixture what? With at least one male contributor. Okay. Were you able to do any further analysis on that DNA profile? I ran that through StarMix as well. And what conclusion did you reach? Objection leading. Overrule. The witness may answer. The same as the steering wheel. So. Erica Patterson and Darrell Brooks are both very strong support for inclusion. Meaning that their DNA is on that gear shift. Objection, leading. Um, sustain us to the form of the question. Please rephrase. Please, again, uh, state in layman's terms for the jury what that means, sir. Uh, both Erica Patterson and Darrell Brooks, there's at least uh, one quadrillion times more likely that it's the mixture of Excuse me. It's at least one quadrillion times more likely to observe the DNA profile if it's a mixture from H1, meaning the person of interest, 
and two unknowns versus three unknowns. The person person of interest being Daryl Brooks. Objection. I don't consent to being called that name and just leading the witness. Oh, overruled. The, Noted, but overruled. You may answer. Uh, we run star mix for the profile itself, and then each individual standard is run. So each person will have its own individual stat. So in this case, both Erica and Darrell are greater than um, one times 10 to the 15th, which is our one quadrillion. All right, thank you. Uh, sir, up on the table to your left, there's an item in a bag that's been marked as exhibit number 87. Do you see that? Yes, could you pull that down and take a look at that for me, please? Do you recognize exhibit number 87? I do, yes. And is that an item that you worked on? Yes, it is. Were you able to develop a DNA profile from exhibit 87? Yes, I was. What did you find? That was a two-person mixture with at least one male contributor. And uh, were you able to analyze that further using StarMix? I was. What conclusions did you reach? Uh, Erica Patterson has very strong support for exclusion. Darrell Brooks has strong support for, for exclusion. Wilhelm Hospital has very strong support for inclusion. He is above that one quadrillion threshold that we have. Okay. And last, I'm not sure, Madam Clerk, if you still have uh, the exhibit handy. If not, we can just talk about it. I'm looking for the sweatshirt that was item number 84. Exhibit 84? It is? Okay. Judge, would you please hand that to the witness? Yes, the Robert Care Clock I'm handing. Um, exhibit number 84 to the witness. Go ahead. Thank you. What was the other exhibit number? The hat? The hat is 87 and the sweatshirt is 84. Sir, do you recognize item number 84 or exhibit number 84, I should say? I do. Is that an item that you processed? Yes, it is. Were you able to develop a DNA profile from Exhibit 84? Yes, I was. What did you find? Um, I first looked at this. Typically, we'll swab, if we're trying to find the wear of an item, um, areas that skin contacts. So on shirts, a lot of times, we'll swab the back of the neck area or the cufflinks. So I swabbed both of those. Um, there was a reddish brown stain on the right sleeve that tested presumptive positive for blood. So I took that, a cutting of that, and then there were five hairs. There were more than five hairs, but I took five <coughs> hairs that looked like they had roots on them for extraction. Okay. And uh, were you able to um, develop any DNA profiles from any of those swabbings or hairs? Yes, I was. Which? Let's start with swabs. Okay. Um, the swabbing of the collar of the sweatshirt was a three-person mixture with at least one male. How about the cuffs of the of the sweatshirt? The cuffs were also a three-person mixture with one male. And how about the stain on the right cuff? Uh, that was a two-person mixture with at least one male. Okay. Um, going back to the collar, the swab of the collar, did you use StarMix software to uh, rule in or out the possibility of Mr. Brooks being included in that profile? Objection. I don't consent to be in court. That name is leading the witness. Um, noted. Overruled. The witness may answer. Yes, I did. What was your finding? Uh, Mr. Brooks has very strong support for inclusion. He's above that one quadrillion threshold. Okay. How about the cuffs on the sweatshirt? What was your finding and ultimate conclusion as to Mr. Brooks' uh, likelihood of uh, DNA in that mix? Objection. Okay. I don't consent to being called that name. Leading the witness. Um, noted. <coughs> overruled. The witness may answer. 
that three person mixture with at least one male. Um, the same thing, Ms. Uh, Darrell Brooks was very strong support for inclusion, greater than one quadrillion times. And the last item you said was a stain on the right cuff of the sweatshirt? Correct. Did you reach any uh, ultimate conclusion as it relates to that item? That was a two person mixture with at least one male contributor. And what was your conclusion? Um, Both Erica Patterson and Darrell Brooks are very strong support for inclusion. You said that substance did was a, a presumptive positive for blood. Correction, Lee. Um, overrule. You, the witness may answer. That's correct. All right. Thank you, sir. I don't have any other questions at this time, but I would move uh, Exhibit 91 into evidence. His report, Your Honor. Thank you. I'll take. Care. Um, exhibit 91 is received. Any reason to keep the exhibits? <coughs> the witness uh, can I see that last exhibit? I, I, I'm thinking of the 87 with the sweatshirt. You want me to hold it up? Or yeah. Is that 87? Yeah. Okay. Um, exhibit 91 is received. Any reason to keep the exhibits? Yeah. The witness is present. This cat that I'm holding up is 87. And then he has 91, which is his, which is his report. I'll keep that in front of him for now, or he can keep that in front of him for now. Go ahead when you're ready. These uh, these DNA analysis with uh, star mix. Uh, I'm a little curious to get clarification on uh, what does it mean. Uh, when you say mixture, what exactly does that mean? <coughs> a mixture just means that it is more than one person present in the profile. So by, by it being more than one person present in the profile, would it be fair to say that that would constitute it being more than one person? Yes. The gear shift had a, a three person mixture, so would that would that apply to the gear shift the same that it would likelihood that it's three different people's DNA on the gear shift? That's correct. And from and for the steering wheel, a two person mixture. So that would be two people for DNA for the steering wheel? Correct. Do you recall when you did this uh, DNA analyst? Analyzation, rather, I'm sorry. On any specific item, or all of them. Uh, do you recall when you did the all the items, I guess? Uh, so, most of the items were collected in November. They were not transferred to the Madison lab until <coughs> the end of January. So I started, I believe January 31st was the first day that I started analysis. And then my report was written April 29th. So you started the analysis at the end of January? Correct. And you did your report in April, why so long? Uh, I generated 583 pages and my report's 15 pages long, so that takes a little bit of time. So you broke down the 583 pages 
it, it to 15. Correct. To the best of your knowledge, do you know why it took from November to January for you to actually get the items that you were going to analyze for DNA? Uh, other than me picking up the case then, not really, no, I don't know. Do you know where the items were kept prior to you receiving them? Yes. Uh, can you stay for the jury for the record? Um, our evidence technicians, when they came to the Madison lab, put them into uh, storage where all evidence is stored. Were the items sealed like they are now? Yes. And so I'm assuming you had to <clears throat> unseal them, get them out of the sealing packages to do the analyzation. Would that be fair to say? That's correct, yes. And did you... Did you yourself alone do the analyzation, or did you have other uh, people that you worked with? I did all of the uh, DNA myself. Uh, did you repackage the items after you were done yourself? Yes, I did. And did you return them back to where you had received them from, or did you keep them at your, uh, I think you said the Madison lab? I'm based out of the Madison lab, yes. Uh, typically, when we're done with evidence, we will return them to our evidence technicians who will then put them back into storage. When the case is done, the evidence is then returned to the submitting agency. So the items are still at your lab, is from your knowledge? Now? Yeah. No. Well, I, I asked that, let me give you some clarity. I asked that because you said at, at the completion of the case, they would be returned to the agency that you received them from. So I was kind of <coughs> trying to get clarity on that. So do you know if they were returned to the agency you received them from already? I believe they were. So it'd be fair to say in this situation, the, the the items weren't continued to be stored at the Madison lab. That's correct. A lot of these uh, DNA analysis, uh, I noticed that specifically the DNA was analyzed for eight people. Would that be fair to say? Uh, sounds right, yes. And specifically referring to the analysis that had uh, three-person mixtures and, and things of that nature. What happens to the third-person mixture that is uh, excluded? I is it any way? The question. Well, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I don't understand the question. <laughs> well, I guess I'm referring to when someone is excluded, which I interpret as ruled out, there's still that mystery third mixture. It, it, can that third mixture be identified in, in, in some way or how does yeah. that work? Sorry. Uh, yes, we would need a standard submitted from another person uh, who they believe could possibly be the source of that DNA. So would it be fair to say for, for the analysis that you that you did that had three-person mixtures 
there's still a DNA that you that you found that's unknown. That's correct. And can you explain what is CODIS? Is, is that pronounced right? CODIS or Kodak? Yes, it is. Uh, can you explain what CODIS sure. is? CODIS stands for the Combined DNA Index System, and it is a database of known individuals. <coughs> And when you find that a DNA, I'm, I'm guessing, I, I don't know if the right word to use would be sample, or I, I don't know if that's correct. Um, when you come to the conclusion that a DNA sample is not eligible for entry into CODIS, what exactly does that mean? There are certain rules that we must abide by for putting profiles into CODIS. Um, depending on where it's collected from, uh, pretty much determines the eligibility on whether or not we can put it in. One of your uh, analysis had a four-person mixture. Uh, were you able to determine uh, out of the eight DNAs that you ran if if any of those DNAs were found on that specific item? Your Honor, I object that it's vague. I'm not sure which item he's referring to. I'm referring to, uh, it says... Brim, brim of maroon winter style hat. What page are you on, please, sir? Uh, six. All right, so you want the directly the witness to page six? Yes. That particular item? Yes, that's, that's where I read it from, yes. Okay, thank you. Do you want, did you ask the question? Yeah, I said uh, this one uh, in particular, the one I'm referring to, has a four person mixture. Um, Did, did your analysis identify any one of those four people out of the eight DNA samples that you were analyzing? Uh, no, it did not. Would it be fair to say for uh, pretty much all the items that you did analysis on, there were at minimum two or three person mix mixtures? Uh, no. And why would you say that? Uh, typically in our reports, we lump the star mix samples together. If you look before that, it will have items that were single source profiles. That's why I said the majority uh, or, or if not all. I didn't say every single one. I wouldn't say the majority, no.
Sorry, he looks that way. The is it auto some autosomo autosomal how, how do you say that word I'm Auto, sorry. autosomal autosomal <laughs> str dna results and conclusions that starts on page five would that be fair to say it's correct yes and ends on page 13 would that be fair to say Correct, yes. Would it be fair to say that page thirteen, twelve, eleven? 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 6, out of all those pages, only 3 have single source and, and all the rest of them have at least 2 or 3 mixtures would that be fair to say um no and can you point out where the inaccuracy may be sure in um, case i'm not being accurate yeah on page six uh the first profile that you're looking at cuttings of the apparent hair from the gas tank strap that's a single source profile that's one uh the next the next line the cutting of the unlit end of the blunt is one two cuttings of the apparent roots from the hairs which is cc4 cc5 and cc8 so that's three items right there so you're looking at the actual heading that's correct and is that is that it from on that page yes any other pages? Which direction is the books? Forward or backwards? Uh, I don't consent to being called that name. We're going, we're going from page six. Are you asking single source profiles? To page seven. From page seven, do you see any single, single, single source? Or, yes, I guess it would be called single source. No. From page 6 to 13, as you previously stated, uh, those are my star mix ones. So each one of those is going to be a mixture profile. So the majority of them have mixture prof uh, mixture, a mixture of persons? From those pages, yes. But there are many single source profiles before the star mix conclusions. Do you recall who you turned your, your report over to once you finished your uh, report? 
for a technical review. I'm sorry, can you, can you repeat that? For a technical review? Uh, one, I'm, I'm referring to once you uh, had finished your written report. Do you recall who you turned that over to? Yes. Uh, you stated for the jury and for the record? Uh, Kelly Gajewski was my tech reviewer. Can you and spell that last name for the record? It's Gajewski, G-A-J-E-W-S-K-I. Thank you. <coughs> and do you know what happened to the written report from from that point? Uh, after she reviews it, sent it back for edits, and then I fix those. It was approved by her. Then it goes to a supervisor for an administrative review. Fix the edits. What do you mean by fix the edits? If there's any typos or anything like that, it'll come back. Or if I forgot to initial a page or something like that, I'll fix those and then send it back to her for approval. Uh, working with law enforcement, which, which you've stated you've done numerous times, and in regards to written reports, to your knowledge, are you aware of uh, officers taking a, a a creative writing course? Objection relevance. Rounds. Uh, sustained. That's the fourth <coughs> question. Have you yourself ever took in a, a creative writing course? Objection, relevance, Rouse. sustained, not relevant. Next question. Have you or anyone you know filed a complaint in this matter? <coughs> no. Would you consider yourself an injured party in this matter? No. ever directly talk to the plaintiff in this matter? I don't know how I would talk to the state of Wisconsin. Can, can you repeat that? I'm sorry. I do not know how I would talk to the state of Wisconsin. It's an entity, not a person. Not, not a person, right. Page six of your report, you were uh, identifying for the defendant the uh, some of the single source profiles that you developed. Do you recall that? Yes. And uh, one of the items you described as items CC4A, CC5A, and CC8A. Do you see that? Objection yes. leading. Overruled the witness may answer. Go ahead. Yes, I do. What do those items represent? Objection, leading. Um, overrule the witness may answer. <clears throat> those are cuttings of the apparent root ends of the hairs that I took off the sweatshirt. I forgot to ask you about the hairs. Objection, leading. Did you? I'm sorry, that was a statement. I'll move on, Your Honor. Thank you. You told Mr. Brooks on cross that you developed a single source profile for those hairs. Is that right? Objection. I don't consent to being called that name and it's leading the witness. Um, the objections are noted overruled. The <coughs> witness may answer. That's correct. Who was the source of those hairs on that sweatshirt? States exhibit number 84. Objection. Speculative. Overruled. Go ahead and answer. Darrell Brooks is the source. Thank you. Nothing else. Right, thank you, sir. You may step down. As much as 
because I would love to have another witness <coughs> trying to break for the night because it is 549. So with that, I will give the instruction that I've been giving every night to the jurors. So please listen. Do not begin your deliberations and discussion of the case until all the evidence is presented and I have instructed you on the law. Do not discuss this case among yourselves or with anyone else until your final deliberations in the jury room. This order is not limited to face-to-face -face conversations. It also extends to all forms of electronic communications. Do not use any electronic devices such as a mobile phone or computer, text or instant messaging or social networking sites to send or receive any information about this case or your experience as a juror. If you come in contact with the parties, lawyers, interpreters, or witnesses, do not speak with them. For their part, the parties, lawyers, interpreters, and witnesses will not contact or speak with the jurors. Do not listen to any conversation about this case. Do not research any information that you personally think might be helpful to you in understanding the issues presented. Do not investigate this case on your own or visit the scene, either in person or by any electronic means. Do not read any newspaper reports or listen to any news reports on radio, television, over the internet, or any other ap electronic application or tool about this trial. Do not consult dictionaries, computers, electronic applications, social media, the internet, or other reference materials for additional information. Do not seek information regarding the public records of any party or witness in this case. Any information you obtain outside the courtroom could be misleading, inaccurate, or incomplete. Relying on this information is unfair because the parties would not have the opportunity to refute, explain, or correct it. Do not communicate with anyone about this trial or your experience as a juror while you are serving on this jury. Do not use a computer, cell phone, or other electronic device, including personal wearable electronics, applications, or tools with communication capabilities to share any information about this case. For example, do not communicate by telephone, blog post, email, text message, instant message, social media post, or in any other way on or off the computer. Do not permit anyone to communicate with you about this matter, either in person, electronically, or by any other means. If anyone does so despite your telling them not to, you should report that to me. I appreciate that it is tempting when you go home in the evening to discuss this case with another member of your household, but you may not do so. This case must be decided by you, the jurors, based on the evidence presented in the courtroom. People not serving on this jury have not heard the evidence, and it is improper for them to influence your deliberations and decision in this case. After the trial is completed, you are free to discuss this case and communicate with anyone in any manner. These rules are intended to assure that jurors remain impartial throughout the trial. If any juror has reason to believe that another juror has violated these rules, you should report that to me. If jurors do not comply with these rules, it could result in a new trial involving additional time and significant, significant ex expense to the parties and the taxpayers. You are to decide the case solely on the evidence offered and received at trial. With that, you are excused for the evening. I'll briefly discuss scheduling with the parties and then let um, Michael and Jen know when to report tomorrow. Thank you. All rise for the jurors, please. The door. Thank you. Be seated. Uh, just briefly as to scheduling tomorrow since we had a late evening. How about we start at 9 a.m. tomorrow? Any objection from the state? No. From Mr. Brooks? No. All right. 9 a.m. tomorrow. Um, uh, for scheduling purposes, I'll take up obviously tomorrow morning uh, whether the state can recall Detective Casey. Um, that would be your last witness. Yes. All right. Then, sir, you have the option should you choose of uh, a opening, an opening statement. Um, so you should be prepared for that. And then to call witnesses, I believe you've worked with Attorney Opper. Do you need a provider with anything regarding that tomorrow? Yeah. All right, anything else from the state? No. 
I, I don't have anything at this time, Your Honor. If, if you would excuse us, then I'll make sure I get that paperwork from Mr. Brooks or the defendant, and we'll be ready to go. All right. Anything else from you, sir? Oh, yeah. We're starting at 8.30, right? Or are we starting at 9 as well? We're starting at 9. Okay. Uh, then Ms. Basie corrected me because we we have to discuss Attorney Casey's testimony, but we also uh, anticipate we'll have a motion in the morning, or I can tell you what it is right now, but I know the well, hours we can then, I mean, if you think it's going to take some time, then I, um, I'll have the jurors come at 9, but I want to be mindful. I know, Mr. Brooks, we all had a long day. I'll do 8.45, but I'm not going to do any earlier than that. I we'll, think that's we'll fair, Your Honor. You. It's a motion to uh, conform the information to fit the evidence. Oh, all right. I'll take what that up. That? We'll have it in writing for Mr. Brooks in the morning. Your okay. Honor. That'll be great. All right. Anything else from you, sir? No, I, uh, I redid the, uh, it's, it's not the exact order that I'm going to call the witnesses, but it's pretty much who you want, like each time block morning or afternoon exactly you'll be it's, ready to it's go just tomorrow. not the exact order like i'm going to call this yeah. person i'm this not going to hold you to that as yeah. long as it's by time blocks if you want to call it that but be ready to well, call witnesses to, just so i can stay for the record so it'll be easy to follow um i did the names by threes i'm guessing the first three would be the morning the next three would be the the evening and then friday Three morning and then three evening. Is is that fair? I think so. Yes, I we may be able to move faster, but we will attempt to stay in contact with the witnesses if we can excuse me, bring somebody here sooner if if the court's got time, we'll do that, but that's very reasonable. And then do you have any idea how long you anticipate your opening will be? Opening statement? Yes. Uh I don't think it's any way to gauge how long it will be. Just be mindful, sir. It's not the time to make argument, opening statements, as I like to call them, and what the jury instruction references. It's the roadmap. So I will expect to hear a lot of the evidence will show, the testimony, things of that nature. If it turns into argument, that's what happens at the close of the case. What do you mean by argument? If you're trying to argue the evidence and what it means, no, I'm not trying um, to argue but this will be what basically to lay out what the defense, what I would expect is for you to lay out what the defense or defenses uh, that you believe you'll be presenting evidence about will be to kind of again give the jury a roadmap, an idea of what to expect as your witnesses come forward, um, and then at some point, um, um, I. Don't know whether you will make a decision to testify or not, but we do have to have a conversation on the record about that. So if you could just give me an idea, would, if you are going to testify yourself, if you think that would be at the beginning or at the end, so I can gauge when to have that conversation with um, you. I don't know for sure yet at this point. Fair enough. So at some point I'll have that conversation with you though. All right. We'll see everyone at 8.45 tomorrow. Thank you, everyone. They're in recess. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry.